Hi listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is going to be really useful for anyone who has considered working on the AI alignment problem, or artificial intelligence or machine learning more generally. It explains ways that you could potentially greatly speed up your career and sidestep doing a PhD, which I expect could be generalized to some other fields as well if you're interested. It comes with a step-by-step guide that Catherine put together, which explains how you can transfer into research engineering roles in ML as soon as possible. As usual, we'll link to that in the show notes and the blog post attached to the show. And if you'd like to follow that guide and retrain to get an ML engineering position, but don't actually have the cash in the bank at the moment to pay the living expenses while you do that, the Effective Altruism Grants Program may be able to fund you whenever it next opens. We'll stick a link up to the Effective Altruism Grants Program so you can keep an eye on it. If you have limited interest in AI, ML, PhDs, or software engineering, then you may well find this episode goes too far into the weeds for your taste. But I expect that you would nevertheless be fairly interested in earlier episodes that introduced this topic, like episode 3, Dr. Dario Amade on OpenAI and how AI would change the world for good and ill, episode 31, Professor Defoe on diffusing the political and economic risks posed by existing AI capabilities, and episode 44, a recent one with Dr. Paul Cristiano on how we'll hand the future off to AI and solving the AI alignment problem. I've also got a really important appeal to make to all of you listeners out there. We're getting close to the end of the year, which is when 80,000 Hours tries to figure out whether all the stuff that we've been working on uh, has actually been of use to anyone. It's really important that we can hear from people how we've actually helped them so that we know that we shouldn't just give up and get different jobs and so that our donors uh, know that it's actually useful to keep funding us and keep 80,000 Hours existing and growing. If we hadn't been able to find out about these stories in the past, then 80,000 Hours wouldn't exist today. So if anything 80,000 Hours has done, including this podcast or articles on our website or our coaching has changed your career plans or just otherwise helped you, please go to 80,000hours.org slash survey and take a few minutes to let us know how we helped. That's 80,000hours.org slash survey. I really do appreciate it. Okay, here's Daniel and Catherine. Today, I'm speaking with Daniel Ziegler and Catherine Olson. Daniel and Catherine both studied at MIT, with Daniel majoring in computer science and Catherine double majoring in computer science and brain and cognitive science. Daniel started an ML PhD at Stanford, but left and is now a research engineer at OpenAI. Catherine started a computational neuroscience PhD at NYU and then left with a master's degree to join OpenAI as a software engineer. And now she's at Google Brain as a research software engineer. So thanks for coming on the podcast, both of you. Thanks so much. Yeah, excited to be here. So in today's episode, we hope to get more information about how technically inclined people can uh, move their careers in the direction of contributing to aligning AI with, with human interests. But first, can you each uh, describe like, what you're doing now and um, why you think it's uh, important work? Maybe, maybe Catherine first? Sure. So right now at Google Brain, I'm a, a research software engineer, as you said. Uh, I'm working on Ian Goodfellow's team, which works on adversarial machine learning. And that includes situations where there's a real adversary that's trying to cause your machine learning model to make a mistake, or there's like a contrived adversary as part of the training processes in a generative adversarial network that's part of the process of making the, the network learn better. Yeah. So I work as a research engineer on the safety team at OpenAI. And yeah, basically my job is to take ideas that some of the researchers there have for training aligned AI systems and and like implementing concrete prototypes and and experimenting with those prototypes and seeing what what actually matters and, and how we can make them work better. We're working on a bunch of techniques for getting a whole bunch of human feedback and using that to train AI systems to do do the to do the right thing. How do you think those projects will ultimately contribute to yeah AI safety in the in the broader picture? So from my perspective, many paths to powerful AI systems will involve machine learning. I think many folks would hope that we could just construct by hand uh, a system that we knew exactly how every piece works, but that's not how sort of the current deep learning paradigm is proceeding, where you you throw the system at a lot of data, it learns whatever it learns, and the thing that it has learned in current systems and in systems we can sort of foresee is not exactly what we wish it would have learned. Uh, so, so, so current systems like classifiers are the ones that adversarial examples are typically sort of demonstrated on, where you can make very small perturbations to the image and get the the classifier to produce a completely different label than what a human would put on that image. This is just evidence that the systems that we have today are not learning the types of concepts that humans would hope that they learn, and they're not learning robust 
concepts. And if systems that are anything like this are going to be in powerful systems, we will have to sort of iron out these issues first. Uh, so that's sort of one narrative I have for how this sort of work might contribute. The sort of problems that we're working on in, in a research sense in this field are still ironing out early kinks uh, in the, in this sort of process. So it's, it's very unlikely that any real world system is going to get thrown off by someone going and changing every pixel a tiny amount. But it is a really valuable toy problem uh, for us to be sort of honing our formalisms and our abstractions in this sort of a research domain. Yeah, so I think I, I like to frame the, the AI safety problem as sort of, or, or like the problem of deploying a powerful ML system in a way that's actually safe and actually beneficial. Like we can kind of like break it up into two parts where the first part is just sort of giving it the right objective at all. So that's like optimizing for the right thing. And the second part is trying to optimize for that objective robustly. And like optimizing for that robustly includes things like being robust to, to adversarial examples or like optimization pressure from other parts of the system. Uh, it includes things like being safe during the training process, like with safe exploration and, and reinforcement learning. So we're definitely really interested in, in all those kinds of robustness things. But like so far on the safety team, an even more central focus has been sort of this thing about giving our AI systems the right objective. And so we're definitely not very optimistic about like trying to sort of write down some perfect utility function for our AI systems or some perfect reward function for our AI systems directly, right? Like it seems like there's too many things that we care about and whatever we try to sort of specify directly is for interesting tasks is going to have loopholes in it that are going to be exploited by powerful systems. So our plan really is to come up with mechanisms for collecting a whole bunch of human demonstrations and human feedback and using them in a way to direct the training process of a, of a powerful AI system to do the right thing. And so like if we have, you know, if we define the right objective and we train for it in a robust fashion, uh, really like we should be done. We should have a system which like does what, what people want. And so that in, in some sense, that's like the whole problem. And so maybe it's kind of a, a broad view of safety of sort of saying, if you have a powerful system that's acting in the world and has a lot of influence for that system to act safely, it's going to need to understand quite a bit about human values. You know, maybe it doesn't have to have a perfect understanding. Maybe sometimes it can act sort of cautiously, but it's going to need to understand a lot. And uh, we want to want to do that as well as we can. Yeah, so listeners might know a little bit about OpenAI already because uh, we spoke to Dario Amade last year. But I imagine things have shifted a bit because the organization is only a couple of years old and uh, it's a pretty pretty fast moving space. So uh, what's what's the broader picture of what OpenAI is doing? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty new to the organization. I've only been here uh, about four months. But I mean, OpenAI has got a lot of different projects going on. I mean, it, there's a lot of uh, individual teams. Um, some of them are, are teams focused on one big project like uh, like the Dota team developing uh, OpenAI 5, which recently had some exciting matches. There's the robotics team, uh, which which I recently had a release uh, with a dactyl, like a robotic robotic hand. Um, but then there's also other teams like like the multi-agent team or, or the safety team, which have taken more of a portfolio approach, where there's uh, a bunch of smaller projects that like one or two researchers are working on. So most of OpenAI is, is really focused on doing a bunch of research and a bunch of large-scale engineering projects to try to push forward AI. Uh, and the safety team is trying to, to harness that and, and harness other advances in the field and trying to stay at the cutting edge there and, and like apply those techniques to, to systems to make uh, aligned AI. Yeah. And on the other hand, I know remarkably little about, about Google Brain. I guess, how is it different from DeepMind? And I guess, uh, has there ever been a consideration of, of putting them together? Uh, and yeah, is, is there like a difference of focus? And, and what's what kind of uh, Brain's main, main projects? Um, so Google Brain is part of Google, which is under the Alphabet umbrella. DeepMind is also under Alphabet, but they're separate in many ways. And there's a lot of collaboration as well. So DeepMind's motto is something along the lines of solve intelligence, use it to solve everything else. Brain does not have quite a like AGI or general intelligence focus. And you can see that in the types of research uh, that's being done. So a lot of the work that I've liked that's come out of Brain includes like uh, machine translation systems, for example, which are sort of being deployed in, in, in things that we're seeing today. Yeah, and, and OpenAI's mission is more AGI focused, like, like DeepMind. So, so OpenAI's mission explicitly is to build safe artificial general intelligence. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited that, that safety is, is you know, part, of that, part of the mission statement there. Yeah, and so, okay, so Brain is uh, like more focused on specific products that kind of Google can develop, like the translation. Well, so the translation work, it's basic research. So Brain is not a product-focused team, uh, but it's basic research that more holistically covers the space of things that machine learning could be applied to, as opposed to specific, like, 
general purpose agents, which I think is the, is a, a more narrow focus that places like OpenAI and DeepMind uh, are focusing. The things that uh, that Brain is producing is not focused on general purpose agents of this highly specific kind. It's anything that sort of uses machine learning or sort of learning or representations to produce, you know, useful useful stuff. So yeah, not product per se, but basic research that more spans the space of types of tasks that machine learning could be applied to. Yeah. So uh, can, can you say a bit of why you decided to, to work on artificial intelligence? So for me, it's sort of an, an interesting story that when I was in my PhD program, I'd for all of my life wanted to study something at the intersection of minds and machines. I thought, you know, systems that process information are very interesting and we've got some inside our heads and we've got some that we can program. Something in this space would be really cool to work on. And so I joined the PhD program because I just sort of wasn't done with these questions yet. And I was sort of very excited about the, you know, the lab that I joined and the, the, the work going on in that department. But I found it kind of solitary and kind of slow paced. Uh, and, and so I was looking to go back in the software engineering direction towards the sort of stuff I'd done in undergrad with the computer science degree that I had finished. And I actually expected that I would have to go to something way more boring to get back to software engineering. I was like, oh, I'm just going to go do data science at a company I don't care about, but at least it'll be sort of more collaborative and faster paced and I'll be happier. And then I reached out to Greg Brockman, actually, who also went to MIT, and I knew him not particularly well, but well enough that I could say, hey, I hear you've got this company called OpenAI. Do you have any jobs? And he's like, actually, yes, we're hiring software engineers. So it was really fantastic timing for me. And at that point, I was thinking that machine learning or deep learning particularly was was on the rise. And so it was a good time to sort of jump on that bandwagon just for ordinary reasons of like career prestige and high pay. But I was, you know, I had a lot of friends who were, you know, concerned about long term impacts from artificial intelligence. And I'm like, well, let me just go to a place where people are talking about this and just sort of see what's up. And, you know, if I'm going to work in this space, I'd rather work in a place that, as Daniel said, has sort of the, the beneficial beneficial impacts of humanity sort of top of mind. And my impression after ending up at OpenAI is that like there's there's really just not that many people thinking extremely seriously about the long term. Uh, and so that sort of inspired me to sort of keep that on my radar as one of the things that I can be sort of steering my career towards. Yeah, I would say I really came to AI and AI safety in particular sort of through uh, effective altruism. I mean, I sort of had been doing computer science all my life and was like studying computer science in undergrad. But yeah, when it came towards the uh, end of end of my undergrad and I was thinking about, you know, what kinds of careers could I actually use this for that would actually have an impact in the world? You know, I'd been hearing just more and more about AI safety over the years and like just became increasingly convinced that, uh, you know, AI was going to be a big deal, you know, very plausibly going to have a huge impact on the world one way or another in the not all that distant future. And uh, yeah, and it, it, so it seemed like a it seemed like a natural transition. I mean, I didn't have I didn't have that much ML experience, but I did have a lot of, you know, computer science background in general. So uh, so it seemed like it should be a very, very manageable jump. And yeah, I decided to try to go for it. Yeah. So uh, what's the path that, that took you to, to working at OpenAI? Because I guess uh, most people who you know graduate with computer science say, I, think, I wouldn't imagine that they could like quickly go into a, into a job at OpenAI, Open but, but you managed to do it. Yeah. So the funny thing is I originally uh, decided I would try to get an ML PhD to try to do uh, AI safety research in, in academia. Uh, so I applied to a bunch of uh, top PhD programs um, in ML and I, I got into Stanford despite the fact that I didn't really have any ML experience. Um, I, I did do a, some pretty strong uh, undergrad research, but that was in uh, formal verification. So like I, I like helped prove a file system correct, prove that it will like never lose your data and stuff. But that really had nothing to do with machine learning. So it was definitely a pretty big leap. Uh, but I sort of figured, hey, I mean, if they accepted me, like may as, may as well give it a shot. Yeah. And when I when I ended up at Stanford, you know, I, I there were a couple of things that came together that actually made it so that I, I uh, went on leave after just two weeks there. And so 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 what happened was like, I mean, I was I was sort of starting to have second thoughts anyway, because, you know, I just noticed that like, my my ML background really was a bit lacking, and I would have to do a lot of catch up that was going to be pretty hard work to try to get to the point where I could actually do useful research. Maybe more importantly, I just noticed that I didn't really have sort of my own vision for how to do AI safety work, AI safety research that I thought was actually going to be useful. Uh, like I definitely thought I was going to be able to find sort of kind of incremental things that like definitely rhymed with AI safety and like seemed kind of useful, but like nothing that I thought was like really going to make a big difference in the end. 
And then on top of all that, I uh, actually got a sort of a brief medical scare where where I downloaded a 23andMe's raw data and uploaded it to another service, uh, which was, yeah, not not the smartest. Uh, uploaded to another service to, to analyze the data, and it told me that I have like this like rare genetic heart condition, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So so all that so that was like literally right as I was starting my PhD at at, at Stanford, and already stressed about out about the situation. In hindsight, I like took it far more seriously than I should have. Uh, it was pretty likely to be a, a false alarm, and like after a bunch of tests, I figured out yes, it was a false alarm. But at the time, you know, with all this coming together, I was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back and take take some time to reevaluate, and and so that's what I did. I guess this is a huge aside, but uh, yeah, do you have any advice for people who have considered doing 23 and Me at this point? I mean, I, I've considered well, doing it, but this is one of the re- one of the reservations I've had is I'm just going to like discover lots of terrible things that are in my future and that I'm not going to be able to do anything about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think, well, I think you can do it responsibly. I mean, so 23 and Me lets you choose whether you want to even see some of the more life impacting things, like whether you're at high risk for Alzheimer's or whatever. Uh, you can you can just like turn that off and not even see. Also, like I went another step beyond that and like downloaded all of the raw data and uploaded it to another service and like, you know, without any like FDA approval or anything for any of those tests. And and the thing to remember there is like, well, it's like a huge multiple hypothesis testing problem, right? Because you have like thousands of SNPs, these single single nucleotide polymorphisms, and each one of them, like each one of them maybe has like a 99.9 plus percent accuracy, but like of thousands of them, like you're pretty likely to get a false positive somewhere that says you have something terrible. So it's, you know, if, if you do take the step of downloading the raw data that way, you should, you should think it's only a very slight, and if something comes up, it should be only a very slight suggestion that uh, something is actually wrong. Maybe, maybe it's worth following up on, but definitely you should not take it that seriously. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, returning to the PhD, I know like quite a lot of people who apply to do ML PhDs. Uh, it sounds like you went into it with like perhaps like not quite enough background in ML to like it was going to be a lot of work uh, yeah. to, 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 to keep up. Do you think, does that generalize to other people? Should, should other people like try to do masters or some other study first? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, probably it would be smart to like start a fuse earlier and like to get into a top PhD program, you, you kind of need to have done some research already and, and gotten some publications or at least done research that got, got, got you really good letters of recommendation from your advisors. And like, it would be a lot more convenient if that was just in machine learning already. So if, if, you, if you have that, that head start and can start doing machine learning research right away, that's definitely going to be a much easier path. Um, I think, I think you know, what I did is certainly doable and people do make those kinds of transitions, but it, you should definitely expect it to be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Can I chime in with some more PhD, PhD rants? There's a lot of advice about doing PhDs out there. I have just some meta advice, which is like, that advice often just comes without like reasoning. It's, it's like a barrage of like, read lots of papers. Also talk to lots of people. Make sure that you're publishing, but only in the good conferences. Pick a really good advisor. You know, who have all the good advisor <laughs> things about them. Like, so there's just a lot of advice that's like, not really grounded in like any particular goal. And when I turned up to do a PhD, I was just trying to like, follow all of the advice in like a kind mm. of, undirected way. I just want to like study stuff in this area. I now think that a PhD is going to go a lot better if you have a pretty clear goal, even if it changes, right? What's the, what's the saying? Like plans are useless. Planning is essential. I think I've mangled that a little bit, but come in with something you're trying to do. Like a PhD is a little like a hacker space where if you've got a project in mind, even if it's kind of a toy project that you're going to throw out, you can come in and start sort of using those resources towards something. Whereas if you turn up at a hacker space and just like start plugging stuff together, you're not going to produce anything. And PhDs in general are often particularly tough if you don't have experience with yourself of how to motivate yourself in an unstructured, unstructured environment. And... I don't tend to think of that as like, oh, there's people who can do it and people who can't. It's like, have you got the life experience under your belt, whatever it takes for you to know how you work best when you aren't given that structure by someone else? Uh, and so I would I would sort of recommend that folks consider doing something other than going straight from undergrad to PhD, because the undergrad experience is so scaffolded and structured where you're assigned tasks, and the PhD experience is so unscaffolded and unstructured that anything you can do to sort of give yourself some time to feel out, what am I like when I'm working on something where 
no one has told me what the steps are and feel that out in sort of other lower stakes context, whether that's side projects or a job where your manager lets you spend 20% of your time on less structured stuff. And then once you feel like you've sort of got your own motivational house in order, then to jump into something as motivationally fraught as a PhD, you're more likely to sort of have the experience that, that you need for your own motivational scaffolding. Yeah. So, so you left uh, after two years, was it? Three years. Yeah, I would have I would have left after two, but unlike Stanford, NYU is not as lenient with taking leaves. And so I spent a whole another year trying to make it work for me, which it didn't, but I tried. Yeah, <laughs> yeah do, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So, so as I said, my experience coming in was that there were like topics I found interesting and wanted to work on, but didn't have like a specific goal of like, I want to discover this thing about how the brain works in order to like achieve this outcome. It's interesting that for a long time I was unhappy, but I didn't know why. Like everything on the surface seemed to check out. Like good lab, good project, got the skills that I need. Why am I unhappy? And like ultimately I realized that I'm allowed to just leave because I'm unhappy. <laughs> like I don't need to know why. I do now have hypotheses that I think are pretty solid. As I said, for example, like comparatively solitary work and comparatively slow feedback cycles, which sort of led me to something like software engineering, which is more group or team based a lot of the time and has faster feedback cycles. But also I think not having a particular thing in the world that I was trying to like move or, or do or cause, I think led me to feel like ultimately what what if this is going to matter you know yeah, and, the, and I, the, the pure raw curiosity wasn't driving me as much and i think some folks can succeed motivated just off of the scientific curiosity of how does this work i just want to figure it out but for me that has to be just one piece of a larger puzzle yeah and i think i sort of was afraid that something kind of similar was going to happen to me where like i sort of wanted to work on ai safety in the abstract but i didn't have like i didn't have a particular research agenda that i had come up with that i like was really burning to to try to execute on on and have like specific questions that I like really wanted to really wanted to understand. And so without that, I think it would have taken a while until I had actually found something that, that I thought was valuable. So can I get on a, a soapbox about that? It's like one of my favorite favorite soapboxes <laughs> okay. to get on, but I'm gonna I'm gonna get on. Love love soapboxes on the show. So go for it. <laughs> so the thing you're pointing out is that you wanted to work on AI safety in the abstract, yeah. but you didn't have a particular question that you want to work on. I see this a lot in people that I talk to who are interested in AI safety and my sort of party line is that AI safety is not one thing. It's definitely not one field. Uh, if anything, it's a community of people who like to use the phrase AI safety to describe what they're interested in. But if you look at what different groups or different people are working on, they're very, very different fields of endeavor. So uh, you have groups that are trying to take deep reinforcement learning and introduce a like human feedback elements so that you can learn human preferences in a deep RL system. That's one research agenda. There are many ways that that could end up in a future system. Another agenda is, for example, Miri has folks working on decision theory. If we understood decision theory better, then we would know better what a good system should be like. Okay, decision theory, theorem proving is just categorically a completely different type of work from deep reinforcement learning. You've got groups that are working on, uh, so like my group, for example, working on robustness uh, in machine learning systems. How do we know that they've learned the thing we wanted them to learn? Also a completely different field of endeavor. And I think it's, it's very important to keep in mind if you're looking at a, quote, career in AI safety is like, what exactly is it that you think is going to be important for what trajectory that you think the world is going to be on? And then what are the like particular subskills that it's going to take? Because it's not a monolith at all. There's like many, many different groups taking many, many different approaches. And the skills you need are going to be extraordinarily different depending on the path. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, one thing I want to say, and I wonder if you agree with this, is that like, to some extent, it is possible to like offload your, especially if you're, if you're going for more of a research engineering position, it is possible to offload some of your opinions onto other people. Like I sort of, looked out at all the different people doing different kinds of AI safety work. And like, basically, my call was that what the, the open AI safety team was doing was like, to, to me seemed like the most promising, and the most valuable approach. And I didn't have to like, I did have to make that decision myself and like understand what I thought the trade offs were between different approaches. But uh, I didn't have to like come up with the approach myself. And I was able to sort of like piggyback on other people's thinking about the space and sort of just join this team with an existing research agenda that uh, I thought I could just help out with. Um, that I think was really useful. That, that said, like, the more you can sort of have your own opinions uh, and like your own ideas about, about AI safety, the better for sure. 
I'll answer your question, but I want to push you a bit. Uh -huh. Approach to what? You thought it was the best approach to what exactly? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely the right question to ask, right? Like, I think it's definitely a mistake to sort of come in from the EA space and be like, oh, AI safety, there's this like thing, um, which I think is exactly what you're pointing at. And I, and I think, so to try to be more specific about how I how I think of what I'm trying to, to solve is basically, I expect that like at some point in the future, and it could be in not all that much time, we'll have powerful AI systems that exceed human performance on many kinds of cognitive tasks. And, and sorry, you mean some sort of autonomous agent-like system? Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be agent-like systems, right? So it could be systems that are just like recommending steps for humans to take or whatever. But they might be systems that like are taking in a huge amount of information or like doing a whole bunch of reasoning on their own in a way that's like really difficult for for humans to oversee. And I think there's going to be like really powerful sort of economic incentives and, and strategic incentives uh, for various various actors to deploy powerful systems like this. And so I don't want to end up in a world where there's this kind of vacuum where there's this powerful incentive to deploy systems that are used to like help make important decisions or like maybe are acting autonomously themselves, but we don't know exactly how to get them to do like how to specify what they should do in an effective way. So, so that's, that's really why I think uh, I, I'm super excited to work on uh, some of the stuff uh, that the OpenAI safety team is working on, uh, which I, yeah, would definitely want to explain a little bit more about. Almost, almost the core of the conversation is uh, that I think that the path from doing a PhD or finishing a PhD uh, to then like going into one of these roles is pretty clear. And like, yeah, we've got lots of coverage of that. Uh, but I think people are often less clear about how do you get into really useful uh, research roles in AI safety broadly construed uh, without without uh, finishing a PhD. Um, so I guess, yeah, to go back. So so you, you left the PhD uh, and then what, what happened next? And what did you decide to do and, and, and why? Yeah, so I basically just spent a couple of months like taking some time off and also just like thinking about uh, what I wanted to do. I did a couple of little projects, like I helped out a little bit with a research project at Chai, the Center for Human Compatible AI at Berkeley. Um, I thought a little bit about, about like, how could you try to use prediction markets to try to understand what's going to happen with, with AI. Uh, but yeah, then I decided, you know, I think that like, 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 I've always thought, like, I've always enjoyed software engineering. And I like, I like building stuff. And so I, I thought that like, trying to work in a research engineering position for for an AI safety org, could be a really good, really good path for me. So I decided to uh, apply to OpenAI and to Miri. And uh, I spent like, basically like a solid month and a half, just like preparing for the OpenAI interview. So what I did was Josh Achiam, uh, who's one of the researchers on the OpenAI safety team, has a list of like 50 or so deep reinforcement learning papers. There's like the key papers in DeepRL. And I just like went through this list and together with a housemate of mine, and we read like one or two papers a day and picked like a handful of them to implement uh, and to actually try to reproduce. And so I spent a bunch of time uh, coding in Python and in TensorFlow, uh, coding up these deep reinforcement learning papers and trying to trying to debug things and trying to tune things until they were actually working reasonably well. And so, so I think generally like the advice is like just if you're trying to get good at something, just like do that thing and then like see what's necessary to be able to do do all of that. And so I just like jumped in and did that. Uh, and then I then I applied to OpenAI, got got that job. I also uh, went through through Miri's interview process um, and they did end up giving me the offer as well. Uh, so and then I spent some time trying to decide uh, and end up ended up thinking uh, OpenAI uh, was the place to go. So it seems like there's a huge potential shortcut here because you could have spent what four to seven years doing doing the PhD. Absolutely. <laughs> and you said you spent six weeks reading papers and apply yeah preparing for the interview. Yeah. Well, what do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, certainly, I think I would have certainly hoped to do useful research, AI safety research during my PhD as well. I think that like if if I hadn't been able to do that, I would have been like pretty unhappy uh, spending all that time just sort of in preparation for hope, hopefully doing something useful. But even so, like, I think this was like a much more effective path uh, than I could have taken otherwise. I'll sort of, I'll, I'll emphasize that I also see this, like the, the path might be shorter than you think as sort of a, a, a theme, at least right now in 2018 in the landscape, where, as I mentioned, there's many sort of different corners of or different approaches or groups working on something that could be construed as AI safety or could be relevant to AI safety. And some of these corners, like Dario's team at OpenAI, are just hiring engineers. Similarly, Miri is just hiring straight up software engineers. Now, it's not the case that every problem that needs to get solved in order to deploy powerful systems safely is at that point, but some of them are. And so if you are a talented software engineer and you'd like to start working on it, the state of the questions right now is that some of them are just ready to throw engineers on and so if you haven't just like tried applying to the position that you want just try <laughs> just see you yeah, might absolutely. you might actually be ready for it uh there are many total unsolved wide open 
pre-paradigm questions that you can't just throw a software engineer on. Uh, and those need a different sort of approach. And so it's valuable for folks who think these questions are important to sort of consider the full spectrum of problems that we need to solve and see which of those can I sort of best contribute to. And some of them we can just throw software engineers on. And if that's what you want to do, go do that. And some of them need like highly productive researcher effort to crack open totally unopened pre-paradigm corners of the space. And that's just a very different kind of thinking. It's a very different kind of work. But all these kinds are currently useful. Yeah. What are some of the um, problems that are ready for software engineers? Yeah. So, I mean, at the on the OpenAI safety team, we just uh, decided to to open up a position for just a general software engineer that doesn't necessarily have to have any ML experience. And the idea is there is like we're getting big enough now. We're like six people, um, and with a couple of, couple of new pe- people joining soon, uh, that we do have a bunch of tasks where a software engineer could help us a lot. So, uh, things like making a website to uh, collect human human training data, um, or uh, optimizing various various parts of our uh, machine learning workflow to to make things run faster, to to like manage all the experiments that we're running. Um, so basically, like both things that are like directly part of the part of the experiments and things that like will help uh, the workflow for for the researchers and the research engineers. Yeah, and that, that'll all be very useful. Catherine, it sounded like you had some other things in mind as well. Yeah, so I was also going to point out that in the field of adversarial examples, which is, in my opinion, a uh, a research field that has a current paradigm. And I sort of mean paradigm in the like Kuhnian, like structure of scientific revolution sense, where there's a set of questions, and there's a set of tools, and there's a community of researchers that agree that if you apply those tools to those questions, then you yield something that we all recognize as progress. And so there's a crank to turn. And there are many, many researchers who are now working on adversarial examples, turning that crank. And so that's a, that's a case where you don't have to necessarily know how to go into a totally uncharted research field and find a foothold in the middle of nothing. If you're a like competent researcher or research engineer, there's work you can do right now on attacks and defenses in the current adversarial examples paradigm. And I, I think that's not quite like just ordinary software engineer that's like if you know tensorflow and you can read your way through papers you don't have to be like at a like pi like principal investigator level like got your phd researcher you can be like early stage phd and sort of jump on some of these open problems and adversarial examples and sort of push that forward now in my view i think that field is going to need to move on to sort of the next paradigm right the like make small changes to images paradigm is currently still fruitful but it's starting to sort of show like sort of cracks in that paradigm. Like it, that's not a particularly realistic threat model in the real world. What could we move to that's a better threat model? Or um, sort of the the theory of adversarial examples also sort of just starting to get opened up. And so I think this is a regime where uh, if you're like a, a, a research engineer or sort of early stage researcher, there are these like sort of juicy handholds that'll sort of help us move this paradigm into sort of the the next phase or the next paradigm to come where we're starting to really understand what's going on with these problems and then how that might sort of relate to systems that actually get deployed in the real world. Uh, so, so just to back up, um, you left your PhD and that, yes. that, that what happened. Right. So as I was considering leaving, that was the spring of 2016. That's when I reached out to, to OpenAI, among other places I'd reached out to. Uh, and said, like, hey, do you have a job for me? And opening, I said, uh, oh, actually, here, like, do a trial with us. Like, you know, spend your afternoons and evenings, like, throw together this API for for this, you know, this tool that we've built. And that was a really fun way for me to just see what that work would be like. And that went well. And I said, okay, well, I'm about to go on, on vacation. But, like, when I get back, like, happy to do more trials. And so I, I moved to San Francisco with the hope that that would work out, but also sort of considering other job opportunities. And that did end up working out. And I was able to jump over to, to OpenAI then. But it was a bit of a leap of faith. Of like, well, I'm going to go to San Francisco. There's a lot of kinds of jobs that I like out there. And one of them, I've already sort of had a successful initial trial. And there's sort of other opportunities I could consider as well. Yeah. So, so I guess uh, for both of you, what, what do you think it was that made OpenAI interested in hiring you? I think for me, it was mostly just you know, doing really well in the interview. I mean, I think uh, as lo- like once you get your foot in the door, um, once you can convince them that you're like reasonably likely to be capable of, of doing their kind of work uh, based on your background, like it really is just a matter of demonstrating in the in, in the interviews that like you're you're able to quickly code a bunch of machine learning and reinforcement learning code uh, and and get it to work uh, and do the kind of stuff that you're going to do day to day on the job. 
Yeah, different organizations are looking for very different sort of skill sets or personality types. OpenAI, when I joined, was very small, and I was really excited about jumping in on the ground floor of something that was sort of still forming itself. And I think that I, I sort of brought that demeanor to the table as well as just the technical chops of like, yep, you can throw me in on coding something that I've never seen before and I'll be able to do it. I think for any given organization that you might be looking to applying to, great questions to ask. I mean, this is just generic career advice, but like ask the questions of like, what's valued here? Like what sort of person thrives here? Because uh, it's going to be very different for different places. You know, now that now that I'm at Google, I feel like it's like a, a different set of skills that I'm bringing to the table. You know, it's not a like totally new changing culture. It's actually sort of quite an established culture. But now, you know, the, the types of skills that I'm bringing to the table include like sort of working on a team uh, to sort of figure out what does this team need? Like what project that I could pick up would sort of fill in a gap here or what skills that I could develop are sort of underrepresented among this group of eight to 10 of us who are working on similar problems. Uh, so we, you were working on that computer game thing, I'm guessing, at the time, in 2016 to 17 at OpenAI? Yeah, yeah. so I was working on, on the Universe Project. That's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not called the computer game The thing. computer game <laughs> thing. That, well, then I worked on the other computer game okay, thing, yeah. namely the Dota 2 yeah. project. Yeah, do you just want to quick, quickly describe that? And, and that was wound down, I think, in 2017 because people found – the first one, Universe, people just found it was too hard and they thought, oh, we'll have to do this. Yeah, so Universe was, uh, Universe was a project to allow any game that you can run in a Docker container, like any game that you can run on a computer basically, to be an environment for reinforcement learning research. So it was a highly ambitious goal uh, and the hope was to unlock many more environments, that quantity of environments would drive research progress. In my take of why it didn't ultimately get taken up as a set of environments by researchers, one is that they ran in real time. And the ability to run faster than real time is currently a major driver of progress in that type of, of, of in reinforcement learning. And another is the environments were not all that high quality. And so you don't necessarily know like exactly what training signal is my agent being fed. And current work is sort of operating in a small number of environments that researchers know very intimately, which was not sort of the, the vision of that project. I still think something like that is a really useful target for transfer learning or generalization in agents, but it wasn't like the correct next step for the research community to be tackling. Okay, so people have moved on to what, Dota, 2, Dota 2. This is Defense of the Ancients. It's a, yes. it's a computer game that AIs are learning to play. Right, so Dota 2 is a very popular multiplayer computer game five players on a side, uh, requires a lot of teamwork, communication, long range strategy, etc. When I joined that project, it was first starting up, uh, I was working on the evaluation system. So how do we know how good this agent is? Uh, and came up with a system for uh, playing the agents against one another, ranking them sort of so you can see the progress over time because you don't in in uh, in sort of multi agent or sort of player v player setups you don't have just sort of one score like how good is my classifier how good is my agent against the level your agent is like always tied against itself as it's doing self play so how to turn well, it's just still tied into a meaningful measure of progress involved, uh, sort of loading past agents, future agents, playing them against one another, and then looking at how that win rate changed over time. Okay, so Daniel, now, now that you're working at uh, OpenAI, like what, what is like the, the main agenda there that, you, that you're contributing to? Yeah, so maybe I'll start by describing some of the past work that the safety team did when I wasn't there yet. Uh, so there was a NIPS paper last year called Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences. And the idea there was normally in the reinforcement learning paradigm, you have some agent uh, acting in some environment. So like it might be, you know, playing a video game or it might be controlling a robot, maybe a real robot, maybe a simulated robot. And it's trying to achieve some sort of well-defined goal that's, that's assumed to be sort of specified as part of the environment. So like in a video game, that might be the score. In a robotics task, it might be something like, you know, run as far as you can in 10 seconds, uh, and something that's sort of like a hard-coded function that's like easily specified as part of the environment. But for a lot of more interesting real-world applications, that's like not really going to work. Like it's too difficult to just sort of write down the reward function that tells you exactly how well you're doing because there's just, you know, too many things to take into account. The safety team said, okay, let's, let's sort of relax this assumption. And instead of assuming that the reward function is built into the environment, we'll actually try to learn the reward function based on human feedback. So in one of the environments, one of the environments was sort of like a little simulated robotics task where you had this like little, little hopping 
uh, agent. Uh, that's just like a big leg, basically. And so we we gave humans uh, these these examples of what the what the leg was currently doing, and sort of sort of gave them like two examples: one one on the left, one on the right. And then the human had to decide you know, which of those was doing a better job according to whatever the human thought the job should be. So like one one thing we got the little the little hopper to do is to like do a backflip. And it turns out it's actually pretty tricky to sort of write down a, a hard coded reward function for how to do a backflip. But if you just you know a few hundred times show a human you know is this a better backflip or is this a better backflip and then have the system learn from that what the human is trying to aim for that actually works a lot better. And so the idea is you know. Now, instead of having to write down a, a hard-coded reward function, we can just learn that uh, from human oversight. And so now what we're trying to do is take that idea and take some, some other kinds of bigger mechanisms for learning from human feedback and apply real natural language to that. So we're building agents which sort of can sort of speak in natural lang language themselves and maybe take natural language feedback and trying to scale those up and move in the direction of solving more real tasks. Because in the past, we've just sort of solved all these really small tasks that are really our toy tasks. Like, we don't actually care about making agents do backflips. Uh, we care about solving actually interesting problems. And working with natural language is, is a step on the way to that. Hold on. Yeah, it's, it's understanding, like, feedback that people say. What, what, does it mean? what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that sounds, that sounds pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, we're not at the point where it really works with, with full human natural language. Uh, and, and actually understands what you're saying. Although natural language models in, in machine learning are starting to get surprisingly good. So you can train them to the point where they are saying things which sound like pretty reasonable text. So it's sort of an ambitious uh, step to try to start start working with those things and, and see how well we can make our ideas, our alignment ideas work uh, with natural language. But the sooner we start, like the, the more time we'll have to, to make that work. And we, we basically want to be on the cutting edge as soon as we can. Um, so, so at the moment, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're, we're definitely starting pretty, pretty simple. Uh, we don't have anything like really groundbreaking breaking yet, but, uh, that's, that's the direction we're moving in. So, um, I've also interviewed Paul Cristiano, who's, who's working, uh, at OpenAI and he was talking about this amplification. Was it, uh, well, what's, what's the name of this, uh, this approach that, uh, that OpenAI has kind of been pioneering lately? Yeah, so the idea with amplification, so going back to, to human feedback, where we have humans sort of evaluating the outcomes of an AI system acting and like trying to compare which which outcomes are better, like we think that's a step forward, but I, there's still a lot of limitations with that because uh, for a lot of interesting applications, it's going to be really hard for a human to understand what's going on well enough to like oversee this like big complicated process that might be going on. So like humans might at some point sort of lose the ability to directly evaluate everything that's coming out of an AI system. So the idea with uh, amplification, and we also have a related idea from uh, Jeffrey Irving, another researcher on the safety team around debate is, yeah, so basically imagine we're trying to build some kind of powerful question answering system. Uh, so you give it some kind of question, say, you know, like, how good is this transit system design or like, where should I go on vacation or uh, something like that? And we want to we want to train a system that gives good answers to this kind of thing. And, and like, so, so yeah, let's uh, let's take amplification. Um, the idea with amplification is so you, you take some question uh, that you that you want answered. And one place you can start is to be like, all right, let's let a human think about that question for like 10 minutes and see what they come up with. And so you could try to train a system with a bunch of examples of questions where you give the human some question, you let them think about it for 10 minutes, and then they give some answer. And you train a system to try to imitate humans on that. And to be clear, that's like out of reach of like current ML systems. But like in principle, that is a, a well-defined ML problem. But that wouldn't be that exciting because if we managed to do that, we'd only have built a system which can like imitate like a, a small amount of human reasoning, but not do anything more capable than that. So then, then the idea is, all right, why don't we, as this person is thinking, um, why don't we let them ask some sub questions? So they get some top level question like, you know, how good is this transit system design? And then they can break it up into a couple, couple smaller questions like, you know, how much is it going to cost to build? And what's the economic benefit going to be, say? And then those sub questions get to be answered by another human that also gets to think for 10 minutes. And that human also gets to ask more sub questions. And so you, you get this like giant tree of like little little humans or like human human like things uh, thinking for just 10 minutes a, a piece. But um, potentially you can actually do a bunch of really interesting reasoning in this in this gigantic tree. And the idea, of course, is we're not actually going to have this giant tree of humans doing this really weird 
computation, uh, we're actually going to train ML systems to uh, imitate the individual humans in this tree. And we're also going to tra train ML systems to like try to predict the output of the entire process. So go straight from a question to an answer that potentially evolved a, a whole bunch of reasoning. Yeah. And the hope is that, like, like I guess the, the idea behind this kind of system is that we can try to figure out what humans would have said to a particular question if they had been able to think for like thousands of years and like spawn a bunch of copies of themselves and like have this big gigantic deliberation process and then finally come up with an answer. But, you know, since we can't actually do that, we're going to try to make an ML system do that for us. What kind of uh, safety work is there? Is there at uh, Google Brain? I guess that it's not it's not the key focus there as much, but. Well, so yeah, so again, this comes back to like what makes AI safety, AI safety. And if you view it as a community of people who refer to their work with that term, there's really not much happening at Google Brain. If you zoom out and say like, well, what's the goal? Like one potential way to view the goal of AI safety is to expand the palette of types of outcomes that we can get from AI. You know, if all we can do is build systems that like maximize a single number and do so in ways that we can like neither inspect nor modify nor have any assurances about. That's an extremely limited palette and only quite dismal outcomes will come from that. Uh, we'd like to expand that palette. We'd like to be able to specify things that are harder to specify. We'd like to have more assurances that it's going to go well or sort of more ways to inspect that, uh, more ways to sort of modify that that, etc. So Chris Ola, who actually just announced that he's moving to OpenAI, has been doing a lot of fantastic interpretability work. There's other groups within Google, for example, the pair group, people in AI research that are also doing uh, interpretability work. So that goal is to be able to inspect and understand what systems are doing. And if it appears from your inspection that it's going to do something that you would like it not to, that's sort of one avenue for intervening. As I mentioned, robustness and adversarial examples is is definitely a focus. There's a broader security and privacy umbrella, uh, which broadly is looking into how can we make sure that systems classifiers or others are not sort of revealing data about users that we don't want revealed or manipulable by adversaries in ways we don't want them to be. So that's sort of more assurances that these systems are behaving the way that you'd like them to. There's a lot of fairness work that Google is, is, is focusing on. Fairness is an interesting one where I think it's not obvious to many people that a system that's producing unfair outcomes for people is not aligned with our values. So it's like an extremely concrete and practical, like, evidence that we already have systems that are not aligned with human values. And if we just crank up the power, deploy them in more context, give them more decision-making power, more autonomy, that's not going away. Uh, so that there's sort of many, sort of many different angles on this. Another is that the, the work on learning from human feedback, uh, some of the like music and art generation teams are looking into how to incorporate human preferences for what sort of music or art they'd like to generate. And that doesn't appear on the surface to be quote safety. But again, I sort of view it under the lens of expanding the palette of like types of outcomes that we can use AI to achieve as opposed to just like hammer on this number. Whoops, it didn't correspond to what we wanted. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So, what is kind of the yeah the organizational structure that um, ML uh, groups uh, have, and like what what are the different roles that kind of you fill and that other people fill? Well, so it's different at different groups. So, if you're applying to a specific place, always make sure to ask them like, what exactly is this role going to do? Very broadly speaking, to try and generalize across groups, uh, a research scientist is someone who has more experience leading research projects of their own or selecting their own research questions. Uh, and is sort of directing that sort of program. And a research engineer has more focus on implementation in some sense, so that could be scaling things up, or it could be sort of uh, quick memory efficient implementations, whatever that might be. Now, different people come in with different skill sets. And so which title you end up in is often just an approximation to sort of what your strengths are entering. In my role, there's no restriction on what I can or can't do. I'm going to do better at projects that leverage the skills that I have, which are not currently those of picking independently of research direction and sort of leading it on my own, although I am working on those because I think those would sort of better unlock the set of, of projects I can work on. Many organizations have sort of more clear-cut structure there where research engineers might get assigned to particular projects that sort of need whatever skills they come in with. But I think it's often just more useful to look at like what, what skills a given person has as opposed to like what title they end up with. Yeah, at, at OpenAI, especially on the safety team, 
or certainly on the safety team, it's 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 a pretty fluid distinction as well. I mean, I think that like given the state of ML right now uh, and the fact that it's such an empirical field, sort of maybe 75 percent of what an ML researcher will do is like exactly the same kinds of things that that an ML engineer is going to do, right? Like, you know, implementing new machine learning models and running a bunch of experiments with them, tuning them, fixing bugs and seeing what works well. Yeah, those are all, all things that I do basically uh, on, a, on a day-to-day basis. And then what sort of a, a research scientist is going to do on top of that is sort of be really up to date with the literature and come up with a bunch of new ideas for what direction to move in. Right now, basically on the safety team, like for the most part, I, I'm implementing on a high level, I'm implementing ideas that uh, some of the research scientists have come up with. But when it comes to small decisions like, you know, how can we try to make this ML algorithm work better? What's the next experiment to run? Sort of day-to-day decisions like that. I'm, I'm definitely like making those decisions myself a lot of the time and uh, could fluidly move into setting more of the high-level vision as well uh, if, if I wanted to. For myself, I've been doing a mix this past year of working on my own project that I came up with with help from my manager and also uh, other folks contributing to that project too, especially in sort of the, the last stages after the prototypes have started working and also jumping in on other people's projects. Like one skill that I've tried to develop is to be able to leap into something where I don't have very much context and spin up quickly and be able to contribute quickly so that if colleagues of mine are up against a deadline and need some help in sort of the that, that sort of final mile, being able to jump in and be useful, even though I haven't had months and months of context. So I'm mostly familiar with biology labs. Uh, how much does it look kind of like, so I think a typical lab would have, you know, like one PI or one one lab leader, and then a bunch, you know, PhD students and a bunch of other people who were doing uh, doing research under them uh, in, the, in, in the academic hierarchy. Is, is that kind of similar? Or do, like, do, do you have like a, a research scientist who's like always like overseeing what the engineers are doing? I don't think an academic model is a particularly good fit, largely because there's many more research scientists. It's not quite so much like PI and and grad student type model. And there's research scientists and engineers of all levels will collaborate in very organic groups. Uh, with mixes of skill sets. A person with the title of research scientist also has a manager who's also probably a research scientist who they will then go to for advice. So I don't think it's quite as like strict that like once you're a PI, now you lead your lab and, you know, tell your grad students what to do. It's much more fluid. And I think that's actually a strong benefit that there isn't in industry labs as much pressure to like be the PI of the such and such lab. You do have to, you know, demonstrate that you are good at, at you know, leadership and and leading independent projects, etc. But there's a lot more flexibility to collaborate in groups of whatever composition that particular project is well suited for. Yeah, I think it varies a whole bunch. I mean, I think uh, a lot of the projects that the safety teams worked on have been like one researcher or like maybe one researcher and a half uh, working on something just that's like their idea that they're trying to trying to do. And then and then now with starting to use uh, more natural language, we're starting to, to to have a slightly bigger team there. So there's like four ish people uh, working on that, which is new for the safety team. But like but there's also a bunch of really big teams at OpenAI, like Dota and Robotics that are just sort of big engineering efforts with lots of people working on them. So I think it sort of spans a, a spectrum. Yeah, so it sounds like kind of the roles are a lot more like fluid, perhaps than what I was imagining. That kind of people shift between doing different tasks just based on like where they can contribute uh, the most to the to the project as it is. Right, exactly. It's just very dependent on what a particular project needs, what skills you have, what skills are within reach for you to develop next. It's a much more organic process, I think. Yeah, so I guess I've heard people debating like how valuable is it to to get someone uh, hired into OpenAI as a research scientist versus a research engineer. It sounds like that might almost just be a confused question because it just like it's going to depend so much on the person. And in fact, there isn't like a clear like barrier. No, there's no clear barrier. Again, it just comes back to skills. So I think that question, like how valuable is it for a person to be in role A versus role B, that's sort of what skills would be implied by the person getting hired as A or B. And I think folks who are able to come up with new research agendas that are well targeted at problems that need solving are, of course, incredibly valuable. So are folks who can jump on existing agendas and push them forward. They're valuable in different ways. And I think as the set of questions under the safety umbrella 
evolves and matures, then different skills will be needed in different parts of the problem. That's something that I was pointing at before, that right now there are corners of the space that you don't even need any machine learning experience at all to contribute to. There are other parts of the space that would be difficult to get a handhold on unless you've already demonstrated that you can productively do novel research in unexplored domains. And yeah, this is very different skills that are needed. Yeah, and I think that right now on the on the OpenAI safety team, I mean, we're we're at a point where you know we're trying to scale things up, and we can absolutely use just more engineering effort. And I think so. So when I joined, I was the first research engineer, and it seemed pretty clear that like the work I was doing was being very directly taken off the hands of like some of the re- people with research scientists in their in their title. And I was able to let them like let Paul Cristiano and let Jeffrey Irving think more on a conceptual level about uh, how they wanted to build their alignment schemes. So. So yeah, both both sort of from the perspective of driving experimentation faster with more concrete prototypes of the schemes and from the perspective of giving uh, people more time to think uh, on a more abstract level, I think it was really valuable to have me there as a research engineer. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you think there's a difference in replaceability between, yeah, like, I guess people who have whatever skills come with having finished a PhD and, and those who don't? If they hadn't been able to hire you, like what would have been the next best alternative to them? Uh, was it like someone who's like significantly worse or just not making a hire at all? Or is it someone who's just like marginally, marginally less, less effective? And maybe not, so, obviously we're asking your specific case, but perhaps more, more generally, like some people it's like easier to find a second best candidate than others. Yeah, I, I do think it's gonna gonna vary a lot. Right now on the safety team, both seem very not replaceable. Like I think if I hadn't been hired, like that just would have been one fewer research engineer for for at least the next half year or so. Um, although as we continue to grow and reach reach a bigger hiring pool, that might that might change to some extent. I think the same thing is true, and probably even more so for people that are that are able to contribute more of their own agenda. I think that's something that you know we can always use more of, uh, and there will be room for that for for a long time. I'd additionally like to emphasize management skill is something that I think hasn't come up here yet, but a lot of research teams need folks who are both technically competent and good managers. And so so it's not just like, can you write TensorFlow code versus come up with ideas? It's also, can you sort of build out a team or manage a project? Those are also incredibly valuable skills. And so if you've got some of one and some of the other, that'll also go a long way. Yeah, that's kind of a... Uh well, potentially a unique combination that's very hard to hire for otherwise. An additional piece is like people who are excited about thinking about the strategic vision of what an organization or a team should do or you know, sort of where is where is humanity going with all of this? If you're willing to engage both at the level of debugging TensorFlow and at the level of maybe more policy-like questions, that's another sort of another difficult to find combination. Do you think either of you that you're like learning more in this job than you would have if you'd done the, done the PhD or continued the PhD? Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> think so. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it, my, it seems that way, yeah. I think the best way to figure out what's going on is is just to dive in. In fact, I'm directly referencing a post by Nate Stories called Dive In, which I love and recommend, that if you have an extremely concrete plan of how you're going to contribute that has actionable and tractable steps, you're going to start getting data from the world about your plan a lot sooner than if you have some like unreachable or or nebulous plan. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in this sort of thing to look for the smallest step that you can take that brings you just a little closer. Like if you're currently a software engineer and you can take a statistics class and maybe do some data science in your current role, like by all means do that. Like take just one step closer to something in the space of machine learning. You know, if you can just do software engineering at an org that does ML, now you've just, if you take that role, you've just got your face in the data in a much more concrete and tangible way. And I think particularly folks who are coming at this topic from an EA angle, maybe you've read super intelligence, whatever your first intro was, those abstractions or motivating examples are quite far removed from the actual work that's being done and you know the types of systems that are being deployed today. And I think starting to bridge that conceptual gap uh, is one of the best things that you can do for yourself if you're interested in starting to contribute. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, try just diving in all the way if you can. Like I like I said, I when I was when I was preparing for the OpenAI interviews, I went straight to just implementing a bunch of deep reinforcement learning algorithms as very nearly my like first serious project in machine learning. And and obviously there were things along the way where I sort of had to shore up on some of some of the machine learning basics and some some like, you know, probability and statistics and linear algebra and so forth. But by doing it in sort of a depth first manner, like where I just went right for it and then then saw what 
as I went, like what I needed to do, I was able to be be a lot more efficient about it and and also uh, just actually practice the thing uh, that I wanted to be doing. Yeah, I definitely second that, that anything that you can do that's like hands-on and tractable um, is going to get you a lot farther. Like uh, one mistake that I see people make is getting very intimidated by these very long reading lists. There's many reading lists out there of like how to get started in AI safety. Read these 12 books. And you're like, oh my God. Right. Um, people will fall into the trap of being like, oh, I'm going to learn reinforcement learning. I'd say sort of swap that out. Rather than learn X, try to learn to do X, right? I'm going to learn how to implement DQN on Atari. Like, great. Now you can tell if you're on track with that. Whereas if you're trying to, quote, learn RL, you have no way to know, have I learned it yet or not? <laughs> Whereas if there's something you're trying to do, then you can tell, can I do that thing yet or not? So another question I've heard people discuss is um, in as much as you're trying to get an organization to like take safety considerations more seriously, it might be the case that research scientists have kind of more influence over like the ideas or the culture, or their priorities. Do you think that's true? Or is it just that like, kind of anyone there who's contributing, uh, who has like good ideas uh, that they can, they can get taken up? I think for the most part, it is, it is the latter. I mean, I think that like, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a position where you know, if if I have opinions on things or or, or ideas for where the, the org should go, I, like I will at least you know get listened to, and I think that's not that different. That wouldn't be that different if I if I was a, a research scientist. You know, the more people in an organization that are thinking about safety and and really have the long term in mind, uh, uh, the better. And like I think that you know even if they don't have like direct direct decision making influence, uh, just like by being there and like talking to people, uh, you can like make sure that an organization like is moving in the right direction. I think it's sort of to break down what does it mean to take safety seriously, that has sort of two quite different pieces right now. One is as a research producing organization or institution to focus on research that will that will do what? That will improve robustness or, you know, shape our ability to inspect or provide feedback, whatever it is. So there's that one question of take seriously as in prioritize research with a certain flavor. And then there's another of like, be cognizant of the effects on humanity of anything that you actually deploy. Those are very, very different. Like what's being researched and what's being deployed. And taking seriously looks very different in those cases. And those are both extremely valuable. And I think, so from the research standpoint, in either of these roles, you have some chance to choose what you work on, and you can choose to sort of put your the firepower of your output behind projects that you think are most valuable in any role that you're in. And then on the question of like what's actually getting deployed, at a place like Google, even if you're just a Google software engineer on cloud or something, you can be feeding into the organization's procedures around choosing what's good to build and what's good to deploy. And that's actually accessible to people who are totally outside the scope of research and are just that are sort of at the edge of what's sort of getting deployed to, to real users. And I think that's also valuable, though it's quite different from the research side. Yeah, a related conversation that I've heard is, uh, is there much value in being uh, someone who works on kind of capabilities within these organizations where it does, it's not clear that you're having either of these like effects directly, that you're not kind of part of a safety focused team, nor do you seem to really have that much uh, influence over deployment per se, but still you're like part of this broader, you know, important organization that, that could be influential within the development of machine learning. And you have like a particular view about how safety should be, should be given a lot of, uh, a lot of importance, you know, relative to just like uh, speeding things up. Do you have any perspective having having been in these organizations of how, of how useful that is? Yeah, I mean, I kind of want to repeat what I said earlier about, you know, just the more people in an org organization uh, thinking about these issues, uh, uh, the better. So one great thing about OpenAI is that throughout the company, I think the, the safety team is really, really well respected. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a really strong team, has a bunch of strong, strong people on it. And uh, it probably helps out we're doing sort of legitimate seeming ML research. But I think, you know, having people outside uh, outside of a sort of nominal safety team also caring about that, like can, can help that situation come about, right? Like uh, if, if you're if you're at a place where where maybe like people working specifically on, on safety related things don't have as much respect as other other parts of the organization, like that, that could help. But that said, you know, I think it does seem like significantly more valuable to actually be working on stuff directly. I would say that if you if your goal is to have some positive impact on the world, you need some plan for what that's what exactly that's going to look like simply being part of an organization and abstractly caring about something is not an impact plan 
Uh, yeah. There are many ways that could go that could have a positive impact, like get involved in projects that don't seem like directly relevant to the stuff you care most about as a way to get like related experience if you think there's better mentorship on that project. That definitely works. You could, you know, work your way up the ladder of influence in the organization and then hope to, you know, shape how decision making in this org happens in general at the high level and sort of steer an org towards what you view as sort of more safety promoting or positive outcome promoting decision making structures in the org. Now, I'd hope that if you want to do that, that you actually know something about which decision making structures in an org go better or worse, right? This is a case where simply like standing nearby and caring is not going to have any particular <laughs> impact one way or the lot. other. But if you become an expert in like, organizational decision making and what causes organizations to make safe versus unsafe decisions and then put yourself in a position of power. That sounds fantastic. I would love every org to have people with actual expertise about organizational decision making shaping those decisions. But I think simply like being aware that there's a problem is not even remotely the same thing as having concrete and particular skills that will like cause outcomes to be better. Okay, so dealing with a slightly different topic now, what does your uh, day look like? Uh, you know, how much time do you spend, I guess, in the office and kind of how is that roughly divided between different different kinds of tasks? Yeah, so I, um, I tend to spend like, well, I don't know, because I, because I, you know, care about what I'm doing, I tend to spend like maybe 10 hours a day in the office, although currently I'm just taking, taking weekends off. But yeah, so, so I mostly just work on, you know, coding up new stuff in, in Python, in TensorFlow, um, new machine learning code running that code in a whole bunch of experiments for like different tasks or different hyperparameter settings to see how well it's working. And then like, you know, based on the results of those experiments, going back and tweaking something to make it better, uh, fixing bugs and those kinds of things. And, and like, so some of the time I'll be working on something that's completely new, like we'll be solving a, a task we haven't approached yet, or like adding some new new twist to the to the uh, machine learning problem. Uh, or Or we'll just have some existing benchmark that we're trying to do better at. And it's just a matter of making things run faster or like, you know, improving the training process to make it learn more effectively. So it's both being able to do new things and uh, and uh, doing better at existing existing tasks. Yeah, so it's a lot of back and forth. Sometimes I try to have like two things I'm working on at the same time so I can like code on one and like fire off the experiments and while those experiments are running, like go back to the other thing. It's a little bit multitasky and something I'm still figuring out how to deal with. But yeah, that's that's the bulk of what I do. Yeah, similarly, I spend the bulk of my uninterrupted times, I at least strive to spend coding because that's the most valuable time for code. Um, any given project sort of looks different at sort of different phases of its life cycle. I also try to have two projects, uh, one that might be sort of a little more just sort of put in the hours and you know what you have to build and you just have to build it. And then another that might be sort of more experimental where you're throwing together prototypes or reading things that are related or talking to people about those ideas. I also spend maybe 20% of my time on uh, what I think of as sort of more uh, in the in the in the vein of like policy or or outreach sort of about what our team is doing and how that's important both internally and externally. So some of that sort of within Google working on groups that are looking at how do we implement the security and privacy principles, uh, what sort of trainings might we need? Uh, or sort of going to external workshops that are looking for uh, the perspective of folks who know how adversarial examples or ML security sort of fits into that picture. Yeah. Have, have either of you considered working at DeepMind or other organizations? And uh, kind of how would, how would one decide kind of which, which organization to go to if, if you had a choice? Personally, I don't want to move to London right now. So I'm <laughs> Same. not inclined to go to DeepMind, yeah. but I hear great things about them okay. if you'd like to go to London. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know a couple of people uh, on the safety team at DeepMind and on the ML security team at DeepMind. I think, yeah, I think they're definitely doing doing valuable work as well. But I, I think, you know, I think you should really just look at some of the work that these teams have been doing and see what just seems the most most valuable to you and, and also the most exciting for you to work on yourself and uh, and then see if you can like handle moving to moving to wherever the, the thing is. I also want to emphasize again that just because or not everything that's good to do is labeled AI safety. Yeah. Like if you restrict yourself just to things that are called a safety team, you're going to miss a lot of important problems, a lot of good mentorship that's not under that umbrella. Of course, it's easy to just do, I think there's also the flip side, it's easy to do something that just rhymes with the problems that you care about, but isn't actually going to contribute. 
that can be an okay way to get some related experience, right? So one thing to highlight is uh, many research orgs do some sort of residency or fellowship program. Uh, the Google AI residency is sort of one of the more well-known ones, but there are many year-long programs like this that'll spin people up on research. So don't restrict yourselves just to the ones that are like in the orgs that immediately come to mind, because there's plenty of these sorts of fellowship or training programs. Similarly, any given research question that you find interesting, uh, I'm sure there are many groups who are tackling it from different angles. So if you have some question in mind, you can go from there rather than just trying to key off, is it called a safety team or not? Yeah. Are there any kind of specific projects uh, that you think uh, are underrated or uh, yeah, people, aren't, people aren't sufficiently aware of? So one organization I want to plug is Ott, uh, run by Andreas Strilmuller, which is... Well, it's very related to the to the, some of the stuff we're working on on the safety team at OpenAI, but it's trying to do uh, human experiments around uh, amplification in particular. So it's trying to trying to like do experiments to see how does it work when you try to break up a question into smaller sub questions and like only have any individual person think for a small amount of time, uh, but like have the the thing as a whole involve a whole bunch of thinking. And uh, yeah, I think they've been been looking for looking to hire research engineers for for a while. So so that might be a place you haven't heard of. Um, and I think, yeah, the, up, the output of their work will be super useful for informing how we want to continue doing research on the safety team. Yeah, I think one area that people often overlook is like verification of neural nets. That's happening in a lot of different places. But yeah, I think verification of neural nets is sort of under underappreciated. Uh, there's been some early progress. It doesn't quite work at scale yet, but it could. And that would be a fantastic tool to have in our toolkit. Where do you think you might go next after your current current position or project? Good question. So. The place that I'm currently trying to go with my career is a combination of having sort of good technical chops, like implementation skills, uh, some sense of, uh, it's like some nose for research direction, and also management skills. So I'd like to be able to empower teams to work better. I'm doing as much of that as I can in my current role, but I definitely would like to move towards a management role in the future. Yeah, so I, I'd really like to move in a direction where I'm doing more researchy, researchy work and coming up with my own ideas, my own agenda, because I think it's both the case that those ideas would be really useful on their own right, but also just having that kind of big picture vision like would, would help me make better low-level decisions when I'm doing like engineering type work as well. Like I've, I've noticed that it's really important to understand what the goal actually is and yeah, what we're trying to aim for when we're trying to develop a system and like I can sort of have an all right idea of that and make some make some calls of my own. But like the, the better the better my, my understanding is there, the more effectively I can work on my own and the more effectively I can make the right decisions about what's the right tweak we should try next. What's the number I should actually be trying to optimize and so forth. What are kind of the, the biggest disagreements uh, between people who are interested in alignment in machine learning? And uh, did you have any views on, on any of it? Are there any controversial questions that pe- people, people have like uh, heated, heated conversations about? The primary disagreement that comes to mind, it's not so much a disagreement you'd have a heated conversation about as just a difference in vision is like, what should we build? Mm. But if you sort of start from the classic AI safety thought experiments, they basically boil down to if we were to build some sort of long range goal planning agent with high autonomy that... Uh, can sort of reason consequentially and is optimizing for a single objective, that will go badly. Like, yeah, uh, no one's about to build one of these. Uh, What should we build instead? And I think that negative space is actually a much richer space than people realize. Like, sure, there's one thing that would be really bad to build, uh, but what else, (laughs) what of the many other things could we or should we build? And I think that leads to a lot of difference in what you see in different agendas. You know, a system like a like Paul's amplification project is not necessarily going to like go around the world and or go around your house and clean your dishes. It's just not that kind of system. Uh, should we have agents that wash dishes? What should they be like? Should we have agents that make important decisions in major world powers? What should those be like? Is that even a good idea at all? Should we just make sure we never build those? I think these differences in vision for the future are actually pretty substantial in people's motivations uh, in terms of what they work on, what they envision building. I think they often go unsaid that we can sort of sweep all this under the rug of, oh, well, we all just want to build something such that it goes well for everyone. (laughs) And the negative space of go poorly is actually huge. 
Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. I mean, on the safety team, we're also definitely not trying to build a sort of monolithic uh, super intelligence, which is going to rule the world. Um, yeah, we, we are also definitely hoping to, you know, have a much more gradual transition where we build systems which sort of are usable to, you know, enhance our capabilities and like give us useful advice and like slowly take us to to a world where more and more things are being being optimized uh, with with AI systems somewhere in the loop. But do that in a, in a safe manner and without suddenly suddenly transforming the world. And, and like in general, you know, there's uh, not that much of a reason to uh, deploy things that are actually agents and acting on, on their own right in the world. Although I think you get a lot of safety problems, uh, even if you just have systems that are sort of giving uh, humans advice, right? Like if, if humans don't understand why decisions are being made or, or why, um, why a certain thing was being recommended, they could still end up causing a lot of damage, even if, you know, the AI system isn't actually acting on its own. I'll also point out in a similar vein that I think there are some non-disagreements that appear to be disagreements just because of differences in framing. So from the community that would call itself the AI safety community, there's a focus on AGI as an example of an extremely transformative technology, which people think would go badly by default. From other sort of communities within ML, there's more of a focus on intelligence amplification. Let's sort of broaden the scope away from these uh, Terminator-like autonomous powerful systems and focus on other ways that automated decision-making can make people's lives better. These are extraordinarily c compatible views. They're like almost the same view that like excessive focus on powerful autonomous systems is going to go badly. Right. Like that's exactly what both communities believe, but there's sort of differences in emphasis and differences in language that sort of obscure like fundamental commonalities in vision, I think, of what would be good to do, right? Like where ought we go as humanity? What would it look like for us to thrive? Uh, has learning more and more made you more or less worried about how the future is going to go? I suppose uh, specifically about ML, but, but also maybe, maybe more broadly. Initially, when I first moved into the field, definitely more. I came from a place of some people seem worried. I wonder what what's that about to, wow, there's so many ways this could go badly, like different scales and types and scopes and trajectories of badly, but there's many, many different ways for it to go badly. And I'd actually say that's sort of still the core of my motivation. You know, there's like that people talk about existential risk, but there's also just ordinary catastrophes are entirely possible here. Uh, geopolitical strife over perceived strong systems, even if they're not, could be quite bad. All the way down to just ordinary surveillance is pretty goddamn bad. There's like many, many different ways that things could go badly if sufficient care isn't taken, that that gets me worried sort of across that spectrum. Now, there's, of course, reason to then say, well, okay, these are of different scopes or, or, or scales. And I think on that level, my thoughts are still evolving of in terms of like what trajectory is sort of humanity likely to be on and how can we, you know, steer away from the worst blunders. But I think the overall spectrum is just becoming more and more clear to me that like making things solidly good is actually quite hard. And there's many different kinds of badly we could end up in. Yeah, I think I, I followed a somewhat similar trajectory where, well, I think in, in the beginning, you know, AI safety seemed like this kind of, you know, when a lot, not a lot of people were thinking about it, it seemed like this sort of like fringe, fringe idea that uh, seemed almost maybe a little bit crazy, but like just learning a lot more arguments and a lot more like concrete ways that things could go badly definitely made me uh, more worried. Um, I think one thing that's made me a lot more optimistic is that I am pretty excited about a good chunk of the work that is being done, you know, including on the open AI safety team. I think we, you know, I think we do have some approaches that are that actually do have a chance of making the situation a lot better. Uh, so that's that's made me a lot more optimistic. Yeah. Do, do you want to talk uh, any more about the kind of uh, AI policy and strategy side of things? We've, we've had conversations with Mars Brundage and, and uh, Alan, Alan Defoe. Could, could, could you imagine going into into those kinds of questions at some point in the future? Or, or are you like very, very, very enthusiastic for other people to do it? Definitely enthusiastic for, for other people to do it. Uh, I mean, and, and including at OpenAI. Actually, Miles Brundage just uh, joined OpenAI as well to work on uh, those kinds of questions there. Yeah, it's not. It's something that I like want to think about for myself and and get a better understanding of. I don't think it's something I'm going to make my my primary focus. But I do think that technical directions absolutely need to be informed by um, sort of broader policy and and governance 
thinking. And it's also the case that they sort of trade off against each other to some extent. Like the the more we can like enable good global coordination and have strong like international institutions for safely developing and deploying AI, the like easier that makes the technical problem. We'll get more time to like solve solve safety problems and won't have to won't have to think about being in some kind of race dynamic. Yeah, and just in general, like the the, the easier it'll make make the situation. I'm really glad that folks like Miles and Alan Defo are, are looking, taking a very sophisticated approach to these questions. Any system that actually gets deployed in the real world is going to get deployed in a sociocultural context with all of its own complexities and nuance. And I think it's really important for those of us who work on the technical side of things to, to, to remember that that context is extremely complicated and that my training is not in international geopolitics. And yet the work that I do has those implications. And I think it's important to just remember how how important the like whole rest of the world with all of its sociocultural complexity is in terms of the context for the technical work that's getting done. And so whether uh, you know, whether I might go work on that sort of stuff in the future or sort of continue down the path of doing technical research, I think it's important to me to sort of stay in touch with what are researchers on the political or sociological or ethical side of things saying about the like real world impact of these technologies. What would you say to people who are skeptical about the tractability of yeah, working on um, AI safety at this at this point? Yeah, so so I think it's definitely correct to be to be worried about uh, tractability, but I think uh, it's sort of not a question that can be answered completely in the abstract. In the abstract, right? Like you really want to look at some of the ideas that are out there for trying to make the future of of AI more more beneficial, and uh, think about you know how how useful do, do those seem. And I think that like your opinions can definitely vary on that, but I do think people have a lot of ideas, so uh, it's it's worth worth looking at those. I also want to say that like. Like, I think that the common argument against tractability is something like, you know, we don't know what, like, really powerful ML systems are going to look like. Um, so it's, like, really, really hard to uh, to work on them now. But first of all, I'd say, like, you know, it's not that crazy to suppose that something like the current set of deep learning techniques could be extended to make some, like, really, really powerful uh, systems that have a lot of impact. I mean, we, we keep seeing more and more problems just getting solved by by just our, our current techniques, which are still really stupid in a lot of ways. But uh, yet they seem to be enough uh, to do a lot of things. And it's also the case that, like, certainly the kinds of things we work on in the safety team are pretty general. You know, it doesn't actually matter that it's, like, deep neural networks that are in our, in our systems. Like, any kind of sort of black box system that uh, has some kind of sort of loss function and, and a bunch of training data, like we could just plug into our scheme. So like if there's a bunch of advances and like people pretty, pretty radically change the way they, they do machine learning, as long as it still is machine learning in some sense, like I think what we're doing today will still mostly apply. Of course, some of the like specific engineering details that we're trying out now uh, aren't going to aren't going to be relevant anymore. But I think that's OK. And like I think it's really important to, to do really concrete experiments with prototype ideas when we can uh, just to like get some exposure to to real data and have like a real feedback loop that shows us which parts of these schemes are important, which things don't seem to matter that much, at least at the current scales. And so there are lots of useful things we can we can empirical things we can try, but that doesn't mean that uh, everything is going to get thrown out the window when when a bunch of advances happen. One thing I'll emphasize on, on the topic of tractability, which I mentioned earlier, is the idea of like a scientific paradigm as like a happy marriage between a set of questions and a set of tools that produce demonstrable progress on those questions. I think in the context of a like happy and functioning paradigm, uh, there's plenty of of like tractable work to do for people with those skills. When it comes to how do we go to a pre-paradigm question and bring about the first paradigm in that question, I don't think humanity knows how to do that reliably. Uh, so that's pretty untractable. Some people seem to be able to do it. But I think keeping that sort of distinction separate is important. And also not everything that currently is, is operating as a paradigm is necessarily like pointed right at the like crux of the problem. Like every abstraction that humanity has used has been in some ways incomplete and yet useful. And so I think striking that balance between what are the useful abstractions that we can make sort of technical or theoretical progress on that yet are close enough to the types of real things that we want to see or cause in the world is 
that's maybe just the whole pro- problem of science. Okay, so let's uh, move on to the more, I guess, specialized section for people who are really considering taking action and potentially copying your example or, or doing something similar. I guess a, lo- a lot of the lessons that we might be looking at here have kind of already come up somewhat indirectly by, by looking at your experiences, but let's like make them super, super concrete and flesh them out even more. What do you think is required to be a good um, ML engineer? Are there any concrete signs that people can look at to say like, yes, I could do this or no, I like shouldn't, I should, I should try to do something else? Can I actually just not answer your question? Just say the first thing that popped to mind based on what you said there. One thing folks should keep in mind when looking at my experience, but I think many successful people's experience is that it was a huge component of luck. And don't discount that, right? Like if I had decided to quit grad school in a different year, OpenAI would not have been hiring rapidly. But it just so happens that the moment when I decided to change tracks was the moment where OpenAI needed to hire people with my skill set. That kind of opportunity doesn't come up all the time, and my life would have looked different if it hadn't. So if you're finding that you're struggling, it might not be that you lack the skills. It might be that that window of opportunity hasn't come around for you. So don't get discouraged particularly if you're comparing yourself to folks who you perceive as successful, often there was a large component of happenstance. Of course, you can take steps to have those opportunities come to you more often. You can talk to people who are important in the field or write blog posts that catch people's eye or go viral on Twitter or otherwise sort of bring some spotlight of attention to yourself. But I don't want to downplay the importance of just the pure happenstance of people's trajectory, who, what companies happen to be hiring for what or what past experiences they might have had. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So setting that aside, setting <laughs> setting aside that caveat. I just uh, want that to be somewhere okay. in there. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes uh, that makes total sense. Uh, it's like you can't only look at that. Well, we have to look at other people who took your strategy and like, uh, what's the full distribution rather than just sampling from the top? Uh, you don't want to select based on the y-axis. But yes. Um, uh, hopefully there's still like some wisdom we can get. Perhaps you can look more broadly at like other people you know in, in the field and like how they, what choices they've made and how things have gone rather than just looking at your experiences. Yeah, are there any like in- indications of things that uh, yeah, are, are a good sign about your like prospects? Yeah, I mean, I think there is a couple of like a couple of sorts of skills that you are going to need to have. Like you do need to be a pretty good software engineer. You do need to have some understanding of machine learning and statistics, at least by the time you actually are going to do the job. But honestly, I feel like the best thing to do is just try it. Like, I think you can spend like a couple of days just trying to implement, like trying to replicate some, some machine learning paper. And like, you'll notice pretty quickly, like, uh, whether it's like really painful or like really, really difficult for you, or whether, uh, it's something that you can imagine, imagine doing. Uh, I mean, it's always frustrating, uh, even, even for people that are, are very good at it. Like, you know, working with ML, it can just be a, a pretty big pain. So, so part of that is just like having the right degree of, of frustration tolerance. But all these things are things that you can find out by giving it a go. The types of software skills that you need to work on machine learning are similar to, or like overlapping with, but not identical to the skills that make a like software engineer who's writing production code good at what they do. So you need iteration speed. Tom Brown, who's a coworker of mine, who's uh, one of the more successful research engineers that I know, uh, was previously a startup engineer building web startups, where iteration speed is the primary driver. So if you can iterate quickly, even if it seems to you to be in an unrelated technical or sort of coding domain, that's actually quite a good sign. Also, the kind of good code that you need to write is not necessarily like exhaustively tested so much as like clear and quick to read and verify that it's doing what you want. And these are like very different definitions of good. Uh, I think machine learning code, at least research code, is a lot more about being nimble than it is about being exhaustive. Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to test uh, machine learning code well. I think Basically, yeah, debugging it can be quite difficult, and the best you can do is is hope for hope to make it really, yeah, really easy to read, so you can like verify that it's actually doing the right thing, uh, and then like collect a bunch of of metrics on how it's performing to try to get some signal on like whether things roughly look the way they they should. But you're not going to be able to write write tests or like verify it the way you could other kinds of software. Kind of what fraction of people working as software developers more generally do you think could kind of make transitions into similar roles to the ones that, that you're doing? I'm going to go out on a limb and say most, to be honest. I think one barrier that many software engineers have to transitioning to a like ML software role is the time, freedom, flexibility, et cetera, to do that retraining. It does take a while. And that's part of why I suggest that if folks can, in their current role or their current organization, start to gain machine learning skills, 
do it that way if they can't take the time off. Maybe they don't have the runway or they have other obligations. Uh, that There are ways that you can start seeing how machine learning fits for you if you're already in a software role because many organizations want to be using more machine learning. And if you go to your manager, you're like, hey, I want to go retrain into machine learning so that I can apply it to our such and such pipeline. I bet many managers will be like, oh, yeah, great, great. Go take these trainings. Go learn this stuff. So I think even if you find it hard to imagine taking three months off and studying machine learning full time for those months, you might be able to find a way to work that into your current role. And I think looking for those opportunities, I think, could help more people find that sort of path. But if your current situation doesn't give you that flexibility, again, I have like sort of a don't blame yourself thing here, right? Like if you don't have the luck or if you don't have the like flexibility, many uh, transitioning into machine learning does take some of that flexibility that not everyone has the privilege to have. So I, I think a common thing among potential like software engineers or software developers um, listening to this would just be that they like kind of feel underconfident, or I say this a lot of people who are like too scared to make this transition. And I guess for that reason, I'm just looking for like concrete things that like potentially a substantial fraction of listeners might have that would be like, yes, this is really a sign that like you could you could do this and there's a good chance of success. Is there anything like, I don't know, even academic results that I guess like most people will have had at some point that are, that are an indication of capability? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I want to say that, like, I, you know, I was actually, I actually felt quite underconfident, basically, until I actually got the job offers from, from Miri and OpenAI. Like, I, I really was not sure that this was, that I was going to be able to make this transition well and, like, land in a position uh, that I thought was really valuable. So I, I definitely think I got, uh, both got pretty lucky there. And also, like, I absolutely wasn't sure. Um, and I was in a pretty, pretty uh, privileged position to be able to just, like, spend a couple of months uh, trying it. But yeah, I do think it was, you know, I do think it was a good sign that like I did have a strong computer science background in general. I had I had some research experience even in a different field and and that had gone pretty well. I think those those certainly are good signs, um but like they're not like entirely necessary either. I just like to emphasize that machine learning is not that hard. It sounds really intimidating. <laughs> it's just not that hard. Uh, I'll also make a plug for the fast AI course. There's a lot of MOOCs or online courses out there, but that one seems to be particularly well-tuned for getting people hands-on experience quickly, hitting the ground running. And uh, so for folks who are already software engineers, that is often a good intro rather than jumping in through the math. And also emphasis on giving folks like common sense understanding ways to build in sanity checks or understand what's going on or sort of work incrementally. I think the advice to try to re-implement papers can often tangle people up because the incremental path is not necessarily clear of how do I start and how do I know that I'm making progress. And so uh, if that feels like a barrier to you, then going to one of these courses that'll sort of give you that like scaffolding of how can you sort of work incrementally towards something could be helpful to you. Mm -hmm. One thing I also want to mention is uh, Josh Achiam, the one of the researchers on the safety team, like I mentioned, is, is actually working on a sort of collection of resources for spinning up in in uh, deep reinforcement learning in particular, which is relevant to at least what the OpenAI safety team does. Yeah, so I think we'll be able to link to at least one of those documents with with the list of uh, key papers in deep re reinforcement learning. And then like, I think um, he's also going to have some more resources just like uh, giving advice and and sort of more more a more gradual path into uh, and, and some example code and a more gradual path into actually being able to do deep reinforcement learning like research or, or engineering. One piece of advice that I would strongly encourage folks to do if they're strongly considering moving into this kind of path is write out your plan of what you're going to do and then show it to someone who works in one of these roles. Be like, would this plan get me where I want to go? Uh, rather than just embarking blindly and hoping that you're doing the right set of things. As, as I mentioned earlier, I think folks often charge into these enormous reading lists and feel like they need to read these 12 different books or get good at all of these different fields before they can even enter. And I think if you try and write down your plan and then show it to someone, they'll be like, you don't need to do half of this or two thirds of this is not on the yeah. critical path. The critical path is much shorter than you might think. But if you're outside that role, you don't necessarily have the insight of which pieces are more or less essential. So yeah, in whatever job you're trying to get, I'm sure people there would give you some feedback if you're like, if I study these things or if I can do these tasks, am I on the right track? 
Yeah, and I think it's the case that like the things you end up needing to use are actually a pretty limited set. I mean, like people might have the feeling that they need to like go study like all of statistics or like anything like that. And like like on a day to day basis, you know, I, I, I'm just drawing on a very small uh, handful of things like, you know, like I need to understand like basic the basics of like probability and random variables and like expected value and variance and like bias and unbiased estimators and, and things like that. But it doesn't go that much beyond that. And like, you know, you should have like a pretty good understanding of linear algebra, but like uh, you don't need to like know like all the different possible decompositions are or stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you need to know enough multivariable calculus to be able to like take gradients and like maybe Lagrange multipliers will be useful sometimes, but you don't need to like be able to do like complicated surface integrals. So so like there are like some some like prerequisites, even just on the fundamentals, but like you actually end up needing to need a pretty limited subset. And I'd say that the conceptual understanding, yeah, conceptual understanding of a shallow set will take you a lot further than mechanical understanding of a deeper set of mathematical tools. Like if you know what a gradient really is, that's way more important than being able to calculate one because TensorFlow will calculate gradients yep. for you. But if you're sort of stuck with this problem where you're like, gosh, like my generator isn't learning when the discriminator ha has taken more steps, like why might that be? And then to say like, okay, like what gradient do I need to inspect to know like where the information has stopped flowing or, you know, are some of these units saturated? Uh, if you don't know what a gradient is, it's not going to occur to you to be like, ah, if I measure this one gradient, then I can diagnose the issue. And being able to debug in this conceptually fluent way is a lot more important than having a big toolkit of random disconnected facts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, do, do you want to list any of the other things that are kind of on the on the core pathway that, that people should definitely be aware of and other thing, things that people should potentially skip? One thing that I've enjoyed doing is looking at implementations of something, like open source implementations of something that I'm trying to understand and making sure that I like know why they made the choices they did in every line of the implementation. In fact, I've had more luck with this than working from the papers themselves because mm. papers often leave out really important tips and tricks that if you were just implement what the paper said, you're actually missing something important in how they got their results. That if you go to GitHub, you're like, well, why did they normalize it in this way? You know, they didn't say in the paper how they normalized, but actually that particular normalization was really crucial. So sort of going line by line and making sure you understand like what particular choices they're making can give you like an index, like a list of things you need to understand. You're like, why are they using this distribution? What is this particular modeling choice doing for them? Why did they train the discriminator for more steps than the generator. What's up with that? Do you always have to do that? I think that kind of approach can give you like what's on the critical path to understanding this algorithm as opposed to sort of starting from a textbook and then hoping that it'll lead to something. Yeah, I want to echo that. Like like I've suggested re uh, re-implementing papers uh, a couple of times already, but I think it's important to keep in mind that like it is really it is really hard to do uh, if you don't have some something to something more concrete to work with. So like when I was implementing deep RL papers, uh, I did end up looking at the OpenAI baselines implementations quite a bit. And I think when uh, Josh Achiam releases his uh, spinning up package, that will have even even nicer, uh, cleaner, more like educational code that'll be really useful for, for people to look at. And that uh, definitely makes it more feasible. Like there's, there's just like random stuff that uh, people do to get their machine learning to work that ends up making a huge impact. Like when, when I was like working on uh, my like PPO implementation, actually together with together with a housemate of mine, we realized like we just couldn't get it to perform nearly as well as like the numbers from OpenAI baselines. And like when we started looking at the differences, we realized that like the exact way that OpenAI baselines was like pre-processing the input frames on Atari, like to like you know make a grayscale and like stack like the maximum of two frames every four frames for like four frames back and all these like random little details like made a huge difference uh even like a bigger difference than like ran like actual bugs that we had in our code uh, when we fixed them so yeah so it is uh it is the case that if you want to actually get good performance you kind of just have to look at the tricks that other people are doing and draw from that so one thing i'll say to just drive home the point that different research areas take different skills. So I worked on environments for reinforcement learning agents. So I know a lot of properties of like what sort of like frame rate or like step rate do they 
generally exhibit like which algorithms are faster or slower, but I haven't implemented PPO. I don't actually know at that level of gory detail what the tips and tricks are. I know it at a high level, but it hasn't been on my critical path to do that. So clearly here's at least one research engineer in machine learning who's not implemented PPO. I'm yeah. doing just fine. It's like not been on the critical path of the projects that I need to do, but I know how I would go about learning that if I needed to. Yeah, I think it's actually not like if you do want to take the path of, you know, re-implement a bunch of ML papers, I think it's not actually super critical exactly which set of papers that is. Like I, I chose deep reinforcement learning because that's what Dario, the team lead of the safety team, uh, suggested to me. And that's like some of what the safety team works with. Um, but it probably would have been pretty fine to like replicate a whole bunch of papers about GANs or like uh, like the important thing was that I like learned what the workflow is like, learned TensorFlow and figured out whether this was something something I could do and, and basically like gain the skill of uh, taking what's written in a paper and trying to trying to implement that or like tr taking some some abstract idea that someone's come up with and implementing that. But I'm certainly not just working with with reinforcement learning uh, day to day now. And, and, and that's absolutely fine. I also do want to emphasize something that you mentioned earlier, Daniel, of uh, frustration tolerance. Yeah. That machine learning is, uh, I said, not that hard, but very frustrating sometimes yeah. where things don't work for mysterious reasons. And particularly for those of us who come from a software engineering background, we're used to a style of debugging where you can just sort of trace the execution of the program step by step and figure out what went wrong. Whereas if like the number comes out too big, there's no like line at which it was the right size before that line and it's too big after that line. So you need a different set of tools which are learnable, but it takes uh, persistence. And so if you're finding that something just doesn't work, don't blame yourself. Blame machine learning for being a terrible <laughs> debugging context. It's not you. It's not your fault. It just takes more persistence, maybe even more creativity than traditional software debugging does. So that's not, if you're finding that you have mysterious bugs, that's not a sign that you're bad at this. Yeah, absolutely. My husband and I spent like a week debugging a random issue in our PPO implementation that ended up being because like TensorFlow a particular like operation in TensorFlow like just randomly decided not to propagate gradients backwards uh, through one of its arguments and and like as we were coding this like the next version of TensorFlow had like fixed like deprecated this old version of the function and fixed this pro problem as like the softmax cross entry with 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 Logit's function but you know we like just like didn't know what was going on and it turned out to be this really like we had to spend a lot of time isolating different things and, and looking at all our different metrics. And we realized like like in this case, it was like our entropy bonus that wasn't working at all because of this. And so we just like eventually we just like cranked it up the entropy bonus all the way to hope that the entropy and hope that the entropy would stop collapsing. But it didn't do anything at all. Uh, so we realized it must be a problem here. And but yeah, we spent like a, a week with this bug. This makes absolutely no sense to me, but Catherine's cracking up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like every, familiar. <laughs> You're like, even my sanity test, the most simplest sanity test doesn't yeah. even work. <laughs> yeah. It, it can be pretty rough. It can be pretty rough. Yeah. Sanity tests like that have been crucial to my ability to make progress, by the way. The like, can this thing even memorize the training set? Let me just make sure that it like even has enough capacity to do that. Okay. No, it didn't even do that. I have a, like, a much worse problem. So, you know, starting with, with that sort of like, okay, if I crank the bonus up all the way, if I crank it up to a thousand, <laughs> it did nothing. Okay. Is Sounds it like even, is it even connected? Yeah. Yeah. So what kinds of people do you think should um, just suck it up and do the PhD for a, for a whole long time versus people who should kind of take, take more like your path? It's not an either or. Like I think from my more pure software engineering role at OpenAI, that could have been a great jumping off point for a PhD. If I had you know spent a year building environments for reinforcement learning, learned a bit about how RL uh, research scientists think, what sort of problems they are working on and then said like, okay, cool. I now want to switch from building environments for this research problem to doing the research. And if I'd found a good mentor at a university, that would have been a fantastic way to move into a PhD. So I don't think it's either or. Right now I have the level of research mentorship that I'm looking for in my current position. So I don't really have a motivation to shift over to the PhD. But if you're at a place where you think the thing you really need is to work extensively under a an advisor or mentor, whose research intuition is incredibly sharp and to learn what they know about how to do research, then a PhD is a great place to do that. If you think you could get by with just a year of that, try a residency or fellowship. 
if you think you want to just sort of dive into uh, dive into the landscape as quickly as you can, maybe a software engineering role at one of these orgs is going to do that for you. You know, I imagine if I were a software engineer working on TensorFlow right now, not even, you know, particular algorithms, but actually just the machinery the algorithms runs on, that I would learn plenty about how modern deep learning works that could give me a sense of which problems in that space would be something that I'd want to devote a few years of a research career to. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm definitely much more equipped now uh, to go to go back to a PhD if I if I if I wanted to uh, than I was when I actually tried to uh, go for a PhD. And I think like the way I would decide uh, whether to do that, in addition to to what Catherine said, is you know if I if I was at a point where I had sort of my own ideas and and questions, research questions that I wanted to pursue, and I thought that academia was the was the right place for that. Um, like with with sort of that kind of uh, vision in place, I think uh, uh, PhDs can can make a lot of sense. Again, I'll emphasize the like academia as hackerspace metaphor, that if you've got a project that you're really excited about, but you're having trouble working on it as a side project, or your job doesn't give you the flexibility to work on it, or you would like to take just a year off to work on it, but you don't have the funding, like there's many different vehicles. I think academia is one where you can just take that project and work on it for several years with uh, computational resources and mentorship resources. I mean, mentorship is another really crucial one that I think everything I'm good at, it's because there was someone that I once looked up to who I could like emulate in that skill. And so I think finding good mentorship is also crucial. And you can do some of that in industry. You can do some of that in academia. You can do that in fellowships. There's like a lot of ways towards that. And particularly, I think for folks who are Whose, whose sort of motivation is something in the AI safety vicinity, it's not necessary that you only work on safety-related problems. In fact, I think that's harmful because the cross-pollination from other technical areas that are more established is a really crucial source of inspiration, techniques, approaches, etc. So if you limit yourself just to things that sound safety-relevant, I think you're going to miss out on all of that cross-pollination. I think actually spending, if you were interested in doing a whole PhD in theoretical computer science that's unrelated to AI safety, and then go work on safety, that's likely to go well for you, I think, because you've gained deep research intuition, like how to do research in general, in a field where the research paths or trajectories are more clearly paved, and now all of those auxiliary intuitions that you've developed will find some way to, to transfer over. Yeah, that's exactly what Paul Cristiano did. Actually, I mean, he did a theoretical CS PhD, um, and then and then started working on on AI safety research. So yeah, I think I think you know maybe to summarize that, like it's pretty hard to learn how to do how to work on AI safety and how to do research in general, like at the same time, uh, because because AI safety is such an uh, open open field right now with, with without really a, a very well developed paradigm. So it can definitely make sense to, to do something else first and then apply that knowledge. And I think relatedly, there's all, there's a, a blog post by Andrew Critch that I'll, I'll reference here pointing out that you uh, that it can be harmful to feel pressured to be useful immediately, like to contribute usefully to AI yeah. safety immediately, because then you can accidentally trick yourself into or like tell yourself a story that like, oh, yes, the thing I'm doing right now is extremely relevant to, uh, you know, AI safety. And it's not, and I think that it's, it, it, it is and should be viewed as fine to spend time working on whatever it is you personally need to learn or develop in order to get the foothold that you need to contribute. And it's fine if you're not contributing yet. In fact, I'll emphasize, I don't think I've contributed in any particularly impactful way yet, other than by, you know, being in conversations and I think contributing helpfully to those conversations. I don't think my, like, technical output has yet been that impactful, although it's clear to me that it's been the stuff that I need to do in order to get myself on a path to having a substantial impact. Yeah, so uh, Daniel, your story of spending six weeks reading papers and then getting a job seems like particularly extreme. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you think? I mean, so obviously there's there's some luck in this. You're like right, right, right place at the right time. But like, do you think other people could like make that that transition as quickly? Because that'd be incredible if we could like you know fill out OpenAI with tons tons more research engineers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just like you know, every six weeks, just like. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to say. I don't think that many people have tried it. I mean, I I will say that like 
my knowledge was definitely pretty, pretty shaky at the end of those six weeks. Like there was, there was lots of like ML basics that I like sort of like skated by on and, in, uh, in the interviews that, but, but like didn't, didn't have, uh, definitely didn't have a, a good understanding of. Yeah. And I think it also helped that, you know, I was able to do this with a housemate of mine. We were literally spent like 12 hours a day, like for, for some, some of the weeks, like just like cranking out code and like trying to debug uh, our implementations and then also, and also reading papers. Yeah, so I think I was in like a particularly good environment and and I probably would expect it by default to, to take some amount longer. But I think, yeah, I just want to emphasize again, like what was really important about what I did is I just, you know, I, I like as quickly as it was feasible, I, I just aimed to practice exactly those things that I knew I needed to, to do. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that worked well for me. There's also an important component of learning on the job, the things that you need. When I joined Google Brain, I didn't really know TensorFlow. I mean, I knew a bit, but I definitely not enough to do what I had to do or what they hired me to do. And they're like, okay, learn TensorFlow and then do the stuff you have to do. Like, we know from what we've seen of your background that you're capable of that, so just do it. And I think many jobs sort of have that flavor that if you've like demonstrated that you've that you can learn stuff quickly and that you've got the prereqs that they'll sort of let you run with this. That's another thing that I'd point out about the strategy of like, if you're in a role where you could learn machine learning as part of your current role, clearly that wouldn't involve already knowing it because you'd go to your manager and be like, hey, can I learn this thing and then apply it to our products that I think many places are open to that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess you probably knew personally some people who were in OpenAI, so they could kind of give you some advice on like what specifically you need to know. Yeah, that definitely helped as well. I mean, uh, it was definitely essential that, you know, I mean, really, it was just that Dario, you know, sent me this, sent me Josh's uh, document with, of key papers in DeepRL and told, told me like, oh, yeah, you should just read all of these and like implement some of them. And I just went and did that. So having that clear, clear guideline definitely helped a lot. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to stick up links to all of these things that we're talking about. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, I, I keep harping on this, but I'd emphasize like different agendas have different prereqs. So reach out to the group that you would be trying to join and say, in order to do what you do, what should I do? And then do what they tell you. Like, actually just do just that. It sounds like organizations in this space are fairly willing to hire people and then have them like learn a lot of the skills that they need on the job. Is that fair to say? Or I think it depends on the group. Yeah, it definitely depends. I mean, I think, I think, so we are hiring for a general software engineer at the, on the safety team, but like for like the research engineers that we're hiring, we do, you know, you are going to be asked to like code a bunch of TensorFlow in your interview and like talk about machine learning uh, and more or less know what you're doing. Um, so definitely you do need to have a pretty good level of knowledge coming in. I think maybe the right framework here is that anyone who comes into one of these roles has lopsided skills. Yeah. And so any particular missing skill is not going to be the end of the world. I think this is true just for anything within machine learning that maybe now people are starting to graduate with degrees from undergrad that have focused on machine learning. But until now, that really wasn't true. And so anyone who ended up in this space came with sort of a conglomeration of like related background knowledge. So for me, I had a bunch of research experience in computational neuroscience. Is that machine learning? Well, I was doing model fitting. Like I can, you know, tell you about the trade-offs between, you know, different kinds of Bayesian model fitting. Is that what I do? No, but it means that I had some like statistical maturity through that, but I hadn't written TensorFlow. I'd written some Theano. No, oh, close enough. You know, and many of these things, I think if you've got enough of the pieces, then you can pick up whatever you happen to be missing and everyone's going to be missing or strong at a different subset. Yeah, and, and part of it's just you know proving to to the organization that 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 you're interviewing for that you do have the capability to learn to get really good at something, uh, and and so so you have to you have to be good at, at at something that's vaguely machine learning related. But it doesn't matter that much if it's exactly what you're going to be doing on the job. In terms of interviews, I want to emphasize not to pretend to know anything you don't know because yep. they're just going to ask you about it and then you won't know it. So be really upfront about what your level of experience has been and what you want your interviewers to hold you accountable for versus what you don't know. How many uh, research engineers are needed by these kinds of organizations? Is it foreseeable that you're going to be full up and just have, have hired lots of people soon? Or is it just going to be like a constant need for more and more for the foreseeable future? So on the safety team, uh, I think we're definitely planning to continue to hire. I mean, if, if we manage to hire fast enough, you know, we might like, you know, raise, raise the bar, bar even higher. But like, we'll, we'll probably, like, we're planning to grow fast. I mean, I, I was the first engineer. I started in, in May. We just had a new uh, engineer start two weeks ago, uh, Jeff and, uh, 
and next week uh, we have another uh, research engineer coming. But we're we're planning to basically continue continue that trajectory and continue to hire as quickly as as we find uh, good people. I, I think it may it may that may change at some point, but that's how things look right now. But I think it's always going to depend on the, the particular team and, and project. Again, across the landscape of things under the safety umbrella, different problems are going to have different sort of personnel needs, and that's going to evolve over time. I think being in a position where you're prepared to jump in on one of these problems if a position opens up is a great boon to the field, where if you know a new problem suddenly needs to hire five people to spin up a team, and there's five people who have sort of learned the relevant background and are ready to jump in or sort of waiting in the wings, that's going to be fantastic for our ability to sort of move quickly on these problems as, as fields start to open up. My team is bottlenecked on on mentorship ability. Like there's plenty more we could do, but the folks who already are skilled at doing this kind of work are spending as much time as they want to spend on helping, advising, and training. And I'm trying to spend up as quickly as I can on helping, advising, and training others in this. But that's, I think that just varies uh, sort of from from corner to corner. I get the impression from talking to Dario that OpenAI also could use some like, you know, management, project management, organization stuff. I think yeah. that so it's both like direct technical skill and the like willingness to sort of pass on that skill and train others that'll allow us to sort of flesh out the the pipeline of people who want to contribute with folks who are able to get their hands on problems and contribute. Yeah, now that the team is growing, that's going to be absolutely essential. Are there any kind of intermediate organizations that you think would be good stepping stones for people who want to move from software development in general to to working at your organizations? One thing I might say is that startups are often willing to take chances on people and like give you a chance to just dive in. And I think the fast paced experience of a startup can be really good training in how to iterate quickly and how to like make sure that you're making progress. So maybe consider working at a startup that's doing something ML related as a way to like move from a more like structured, traditional software engineering thing. You mentioned a, a MOOC earlier. That's a good way to learn. Uh, yeah, fast AI. Fast yeah. AI. Are there any um, like more formal academic programs that you've heard on the grapevine are particularly good that uh, you might want to draw attention to? PhDs, masters, and even, even undergrad are places where they do good courses. So in terms of undergrad places, I think if you look at the list of places that are top in CS, that's also likely to be a list of places that's top in ML with some modifications that I don't currently feel like I have a a good enough picture of to recommend. But one thing I'll point out is that different undergrad programs teach AI or ML with a different focus. Like some undergrad AI courses are still focused on sort of more good old fashioned AI rules-based systems type of thing. Some machine learning courses are still focused on logistic regression and SVMs and are not going to get you to deep learning. So if your career goal is to contribute to deep learning, like a traditional ML or AI class or program may not prepare you for that. The like the the top professors in any given subfield are going to be distributed very unevenly across universities. So if you're looking at the master's or PhD level, look for specific professors. And there is a risk with that. Like I've often heard the advice that if you're going to go into a PhD program, make sure it's some place that there's like at least two or three people that you'd be happy to work with. You might say like, how does that jive with actually just look for specific professors? And I'd say, if you're applying to a place where there's only one professor you'd be happy to work with, and then you don't get to work with that person, leave, just leave. <laughs> like that's a fine plan though. But uh, yeah, I think you have, if you're going to a PhD program, you should do it sort of either of those ways, have a particular person in mind. And if it doesn't work out, then the PhD program just didn't work out for you or have like a small collection of folks who would be able to provide you with the mentorship that you want. And then if one of those doesn't work out, you can fall back on another. Do you have any good uh, failure stories that people could learn from people who tried to get into this and uh, it just hasn't, hasn't worked out for one reason or the other? <laughs> don't, don't have to name names, but. Hmm. Yeah. So a couple of people um, did trials on the OpenAI safety team. And, you know, these were like absolutely smart people and like good software engineers, but they just like realized that machine learning was just like too much of a pain for them and like not what they wanted to be doing. And uh, so so they they decided not to not to keep going there. Um, And I think that's, you know, that's definitely an acceptable outcome. Um, And like one of them works for for Miri now. I think the failures stories that I see most often are people who don't have a sufficiently clear and targeted plan. I mean, I've been really harping on this piece that the critical path is probably shorter than you think. And folks who don't have a highly specific target in mind and just want to like, quote, get good at ML and quote, work on AI safety will end up like reading a bunch of stuff with no direction. So I think having direction, even if it turns out to be a bad direction, will 
crystallize what you're preparing, crystallize your preparation towards something concrete. And that's, I think, the biggest difference between folks who end up just reading a lot of stuff and not being prepared for any particular job versus have picked up like a set of skills that makes for a good stepping stone. It is fine and good to read a lot for context. Just don't confuse that with reading for job preparation. Like having a broader context of what's going on is incredibly valuable, but it's not the same thing as developing the skills that'll get you through that interview, that'll get you that role. I guess kind of here, my framing is perhaps been bad, but there's like research engineers and then research scientists. Uh, are there like other roles that or like other labels that people should have in their head of like different kinds of positions? Well, I think focusing on like, so, so what are the, what are the skills involved? Maybe I probably should have said this earlier because I found this framework useful in the past. I think there's approximately four different buckets of skill that are needed to do work in ML or deep learning that's related to this stuff. One is ordinary software engineering. Uh, and there's, of course, all those subdivisions, but that could be like build environments for reinforcement learning, build a pipeline for human demonstrators to submit feedback, build a dashboard for researchers to view their experiments, that type of work. There's machine learning implementation. So take an idea for an algorithm and code it up in TensorFlow or debug why your TensorFlow implementation is not producing the results that you want. Uh, there's ML research direction, so choosing what next problems are likely to be relevant or sort of good approaches. And then there's ML theory. So prove a bound on what type of learning performance we can get under these information theoretic assumptions about the data set. And if you're a research engineer, you're probably going to be doing a lot of number two, the like ML engineering work, but some ordinary software engineering just to like get your saved uh, trained agents onto the right file system. And then you're going to be doing some of three of like picking which directions are going to be productive. If you're a research scientist, you're more likely to have skills uh, in sort of those, the, those later buckets, like more theory skills and more sort of research direction skills. I think, yeah, so I think those four categories are going to be a better guide than any particular title because any title has a blend of those and any problem you're trying to tackle is going to need a different mix of those. Like if you're trying to just like scale up deep RL agents to run faster and more parallel, you probably don't need any theory at all. Whereas if you're trying to prove some impossibility theorem about adversarial examples, uh, you're going to need a lot more theory. What do you think of uh, the Agent Foundation's agenda from, from Miri? Could, could you imagine working on that yourself? Or uh, do you have a view on whether people who are like open between doing that and, oh, oh, yeah, it actually is, I mean, are there people who are kind of would be capable of going both in the mirror direction and in the uh, research engineering direction? Or is it mostly just like quite different skills? Well, I'll point out that like Nate himself has started as a Google software engineer and then trained in the sorts of mathematics that the Agent Foundation's agenda requires. So I think folks who are sort of abstract and technical thinkers can often, you know, pick up a different skill set there. It is a quite different agenda. It's they're doing sort of mathematics research. I mean, I know they're also hiring software engineers. So I, I don't know how the software engineering that they're working on connects with their agent foundation stuff, if at all. Uh, you should ask them if you want to apply for that sort of thing. Personally, I think the uh, agent foundation's work is usefully ironing out glitches in our in humanity's current models of what's going on with intelligence. I think Depending on what you think humanity is going to do or build in what order in terms of building AI that like may or may not end up on the critical path, but they're clearly doing some cool mathematics. And if you like cool mathematics, you should consider doing it. Yeah, I think that that sounds that sounds about right. I mean, I think uh, it's it's absolutely appealing uh, to try to, you know, take Mary's approach and sort of have a formal foundation for what the heck agents are and how how we can try to understand what, what their goals are and try to specify what their goals are. But at the same time, like, I think it's, at least I made the decision to, to work on on uh, more concrete stuff that we can actually experiment with uh, today and, like, is more connected to the kinds of techniques that, at least in the next couple decades, uh, are more likely to be more likely to be applied. Um, I've just got this quote in front of me in the notes, so with a quote from uh, Cristiano, where he says, um, a, a good litmus test of whether someone could be a good research engineer is uh, whether they can kind of properly implement um, a particular model from a paper in, you know, X hours or some kind of some kind of test that's been set, or yeah, some number of hours has been set. To what extent do you think that's a good good litmus test? Because it sounded earlier like you're saying it's very unpredictable how long it might take to, uh, to manage to uh, replicate something. Yeah, it's a, it's a little hard to give a specific specific kind of time frame because it depends so much on exactly what standard you're aiming for. Like, I mean, I guess I can say a little bit about what it was like when I was trying to to do this for uh, DeepRL papers. Like, so so I was working with my housemate, and we were putting 
you know, we're doing a lot of pair programming and also had like very different sleep schedules. So like we probably had like 16 hours of coding or, or, or like debugging a day. And with that level of work, we spent like two days on typically on papers where we just wanted to get sort of the basics uh, working and like and we spent like over a week on on some of the papers where we were really trying to get like match the performance of baselines or like the paper and uh, and tune them a lot. Yeah, but it's, it's hard to say. I think I think depending on exactly, you know, how much code you look at or what level of performance you're trying to achieve uh, and, and which which thing you're doing, like the, the complexity of different papers varies a lot. I think you're going to get pretty different numbers. But yeah, maybe that's like a somewhat useful ballpark. I remember one of the engineers at OpenAI when, when I was there was working on like a, a new or a, a good clear implementation of an algorithm. I forget what he was working on, but it took him a whole month to iron out all the bugs. So I think if you're like, gosh, let me just do this cheap, quick test, which is implement this paper, it's not going to be a cheap, quick test. It might take you a whole month. That's not necessarily a bad sign like this stuff to really iron out all of the bugs and details can take quite a long time. Yeah, like even after a week, we definitely weren't actually at the point where we were quite matching the performance of mm -hmm. uh, baselines or the papers. That's part of why I emphasized that learning this stuff takes time, either to do it as a side project and give up all your other hobbies for a month or to quit your job if you've got the runway for it. It's not the kind of thing that you can get a good signal on just with like a weekend here and there. It takes sort of more time and determination and patience than that. Are there any kind of other pieces of advice that you'd like to give to perhaps someone who's, you know, a software developer at Google um, who is considering making a transition to being an, an ML research engineer uh, and uh, just needs to know like exactly how to, how to go about it? I mean, one piece of advice is, you know, try to try to re reach out to people that are like currently doing the kinds of work that that you think uh, might be valuable and like, you know, ask them, ask them how they got there and what advice they have. I think it's it's, it's it can seem kind of impenetrable or like or like confusing from the outside to figure out you know what kinds of work are there even or like what are the what are reasonable paths but i think people are pretty pretty willing to spend at least some time helping people that are that are new and pointing them in a more useful direction so yeah i'm, I'm definitely uh you know email me dmz at openai.com uh. <laughs> uh if you're at google you could do a 20 percent project there's a bunch of research teams within google ai that would be open to that sort of thing um all right we've been going for quite a few hours and we've, we've got to go get some thai food have, have dinner together are there any kind of like final inspiring things you'd like to say to, to someone who's listening and might potentially be on the fence about whether to, to really take action on, on what we've been uh, talking about today? Yeah, I would encourage you to write down an extremely concrete plan. Like what exactly are you going to tackle? What steps are you going to take to tackle that? And then send it to someone who works at one of these orgs to say like, is this a reasonable plan? I bet that they will pass you back some small edits, but basically a reasonable plan. And then you can just do that. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a good plan. My guests today have been Catherine Olsen and Daniel Ziegler. Thanks for coming on the podcast, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rob. Before you go, a reminder that to help with that final point that Catherine made, she has written a guide for all of us called Concrete Next Steps for Transitioning to ML Engineering for AI Safety. Don't feel intimidated. Just uh, read it and follow the steps it lays out, and I think it will very much put you on the right track. A reminder, too, that if you'd be interested in retraining uh, in the way that uh, Catherine describes, but you couldn't support yourself during that the time it would take to, to actually go about that. Uh, look out for when the Effective Altruism Grants program next opens, as it may be able to fill that gap for you. If you liked this episode, I think you would also really be interested in listening to episode 23, How to Actually Become an AI Alignment Researcher, according to Dr. Jan Leiker. That's in addition to the other three episodes that I mentioned in the intro, of course. And finally, to keep operating, uh, 80,000 Hours really does need to find out how it has influenced people's careers or otherwise helped you. So if this show, uh, our coaching, or any of the articles we've written this year or any previous year has helped you to have more social impact, please head to 80,000hours.org slash survey and spend a few minutes to let us know how. Uh, we put a lot of time into making this show and writing all of the articles, uh, and it uh, really does make a big difference to, to hear from you and find out how we've helped. We, we absolutely do read every entry with, with great interest. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.